welcome to the globeethics.net international online conference we gave it this year the title building new bridges together strengthening ethics in higher education after covid-19 i will ask christine to please introduce a few words and housekeeping rules then we will go into the activity of today. Thank you, Obiara, and welcome everybody on behalf of globeethics.net to this wonderful conference experience on this webinar platform. A couple of announcements. The webinar will be recorded and available for viewing on the globeethics.net website. Only the panelists are visible Participants are warmly invited to introduce themselves in the chat box and contribute their thoughts to the conversation as we go. Globeethics.net takes this chat discussion as part of the conference proceedings and outcome, a very important part. If you have a question for the speakers, we direct you to the Q&A box as distinguished from the chat box. We will address as many as possible and we will keep the rest for our post-conference reflections and future steps. So you've heard from Obiara Ike. I'd like to formally introduce him. Obiara, Professor Dr. Obiara Ike is the executive director of GlobeEthics.net from Nigeria and Germany and he's going to guide us through this three-hour webinar experience. Welcome again, and Obiara. Thank you very much, Christine. Um, dear friends, we've seen that over 1,500 participants have registered to join this event, and they are from around the world. We've also seen from the registrations that 87 countries are participating. This is the high point of an activity, one of the many activities globeethics.net would sit in Geneva, does globally, knowing that we live in very confusing times. The tensions experienced globally with a growing lack of certainty on virtually every item of discourse has created a big gap to the much desired inner and external peace which people seek. Thus, problems are mounting, facing humanity, whichever way one wants to look towards, social, mental, political, economic, ecological, spiritual, cultural, and even technological. So the world at this crucial stage, following the tragic COVID-19 pandemic is in need of guiding ideas. The world needs a vision, good visions, to more effectively direct our intellectual, our moral and scientific capabilities for world peace, global security, human dignity, and social justice. This shift in orientation belongs to the domain of ethics. It is in ethics, with ethics, and through ethics that the rapidly rising expectations to solve problems that have increased frustrations and tensions that threaten the fabric of global society can find sustainable solutions. This is why many of you are gathered. I mean, vice chancellors, professors of universities, heads of departments of institutions of higher learning, you are those who impact the next generation. The next generation of those who will lead this universe to something better. Ethics is about hope. It is about life. How to enhance life in everything by doing the right in thought and in action. Aristotle calls it the good. Globeethics.net has always, since its founding in 2004, set the tempo on bringing people together around the world to share views for only when we are dialoguing and talking and sharing ideas 
do we know that we are moving forward? The last one week had been very, very active. We have had um, what we may call the pre-seminar, the pre-conference activities, which was based with our own team on four tracks. Today, we shall be summarizing all those tracks because people have been very active in the four tracks. One of them was creating new social, societal visions in higher education. What values do we bring for living together? And here, around this topic today, Professor Dr. Rudolf Sina, Eugenia Barroso, and Professor Dr. Christian Anieke, the Vice Chancellor of Godfrey Okoye University, will be showcasing their thought and sharing their views. We have also a second panel during the track, which dealt with ethics and new pedagogies. Pedagogies about the style of teaching. And here in Arigatu, Maria Lucy Uribe, who is the Director General with Angela Owusu, our good friend from Ghana, Ashesi University, Pamela Kwatio from Canada, and Diki Sofian, my personal friend from Indonesia. They will be sharing views about this topic. A third track focused on ethics and quality assurance. This is where we benchmark that which we try to teach. Here, someone from very, very far away from the Fiji Islands, the Pacific, the end of the world, Dr. Uplan Lumanvai, thank you very much for being with us. With Jene Jessien Peter from Indonesia, um, you will be sharing your thoughts around this topic of the quality assurance issues. And of course, the fourth track deals with ethics and responsible global governance. Here we have a young professor from Japan, Kanan Kitani, and Esther Mumbo from Kenya, who will also be sharing some thoughts. We have had these conversations in the past, the last week, going into this week, including, of course, um, one that dealt with what does Globe Ethics provide in terms of its resources, library, publications, and so on. It is a great day, and we want to be relaxed because we want to give hope. So I would like to invite the founder of GlobeEthics.net, Professor Dr. Christoph Stuckelberger, to kick off the football and to make sure that we win this football because it will go round, the ball is round, it's like a globe. Christoph, you have the floor, and as you know, time bound. Thank you very much and welcome all of you. Thank you very much, uh, Obiora Ike, as a director of GlobeEthics.net. It's really a profound pleasure to be here and to share with you a, a, a few framing uh, words. To this morning, I got a mail of uh, somebody who was one of the 20 co-founders of GlobeEthics.net, uh, Jesse Mugambi from Nairobi, professor. And he said, we came a long way. And it's true, 16 years of existence. And uh, to see this diversity around the world, 1,500 who uh, are registered to join us, uh, it's a big pleasure. To take the question of the football, uh, Maybe, yeah, a bit later, a bit later, the screen, thank you. Uh, the, to take up the, the football, who is then our enemy or the other party? The enemy is the COVID virus. We have a common enemy. It's not the Chinese, it's not the American, it's not the Nigerians or the Japanese. It's this global virus we have to defeat okay. in our game and it's not a game it's a very serious issue now i thought about what is it about um, the framing first of all i thank all of you to be in that frame of today these three three hours but you see my frame as a yellow frame about, uh, around my so normally we have a frame as a um, uh, a thing that we think something must be in the frame in order to encadre, as we say in French. I would like to uh, suggest not a quadrangular uh, frame, but a egg as a frame. Why an egg form? The egg is the symbol of life. And if we relax a bit, just step back, what is it all about this afternoon? We will talk a lot about all these 
details of new pedagogies, new challenges, uh, new online uh, courses. But if we look at it, what is it at the end of the day? What counts and what is important? What we want to do together? We want to support life. We want to enhance life, as Obiora Ike was already saying. That's all about. Ethics is about enhancing life, empowering life, so that we all have a life in dignity and the fulfillment of life, as we would call it in Christian ethics. Now, uh, can I have uh, the slide? Uh, on the slide, I want to share with you a dream. Victoria? Yes, uh, the second slide, the next one. You see an egg, the next one. Here, I formulated a week ago, a text in form of an egg. It's in from my new book, uh, Cloud Glo Balance, which should come out in summer, you may know more. What is exactly when we look back or when we look forward, what is our dream we aim at? And I want to read it. I have a dream. Superpowers cooperate. Suspicion is converted to trust. Escalation is turned to de-escalation. Domination is replaced by participation. Innovation is balanced with conservation. Competition is combined with cooperation. Extremism is defeated by respect of opposites. Power and leadership are executed with integrity. The golden rule of reciprocity becomes true. Self-confidence is balanced with modesty. Soft water is stronger than hard stones. Freedom and justice kiss each other. Hate is, yeah, there is a picture on it. Hate is transformed into love. Death is integrated into life. Love never ends. That's my dream. And if I, I'm sure many of you look around these values. So when we talk about value-driven education in higher education, it's not abstract. We have a concrete dream. We are united and we want to support this. And this is just to framing uh, as I was asked uh, to frame this uh, uh, afternoon international conference. And that leads me to a short second, uh, next slide. If we look at the diversity of the topics of today, I think we can say there are uh, 10 main topics we will discuss. And I read with very great interest the uh, lovely and very uh, rich uh, inputs from the pre-conferences the last days. Financing. We have the big challenge of uh, the COVID period and post-COVID period, how to finance our institutions, universities. I got this morning, three of my Nigerian students I teach this week and next week, sent me an email saying, I cannot participate in the midterm exam tomorrow because I cannot uh, finance my my uh, term um, fee. So this is reality. We th have to rethink priorities as a chance. Mobility, less physical mobility, more online mobility. How does it influence us? We know that one third of the of the uh, uh, Chinese students, no, one third of the income of the Australian universities comes from Chinese students. If that is left out, many will collapse. Online, equality, quality in terms also of values. What are the values we will teach? Pedagogies, including mental health. You know, in uh, COVID, some students get into depression at home, locked down. Uh, how to deal with that in a holistic way? Transparency, global citizenship, and we as Globe Ethics Net want to look at global citizenship in a period of nationalism and uh, closing down eyes on your uh, national interests. Geopolitics, uh, there is a real danger of a very 
strong polarization as we see every day in the news. How to relearn critical thinking is very key. And the last one, uh, number 10, also the jobs, increased unemployment. That links to the finance as the first point. So this is just a few points to mention in terms of the bigger picture before we now enter into all the many rich details. And I'm interested to hear all of you. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christoph, for kicking the ball and is now going to roll further. And um, many of you were not part of the pre-conversations and um, the entire live chats and webinar that had happened since one week. So we are happy to um, have those who led these panels, that we call them listeners, and they will be having um, three minutes each to say what they listened to, what they had during the different panels. Um, it was a pre-conference that focused on the four main topics. Um, we have um, Globe Ethics Office in Geneva, and the executive director there is Rajula from uh, India in Bangalore. She's program executive there. And we are very delighted that Mary Doyle from the University of the Holy Cross um, professor in the United States of America was also a listener. Both of you, would you want to share with Dr. Jeremy Punt? my own brother from the Cape, Southern Africa, University of Stellenbosch, which is a friend and partner of Globe Ethics Net, and Daniel Lopez Salo from Argentina. If you will be in a position to share three minutes each, what you listen to. Um, we've had also some librarian from India, Tilotama Ray, who yesterday's event was also very great in trying to showcase how library works happen. So may I invite these in order of, um, I've mentioned them Rajula first, three minutes. I will just give you a sign. When you, two and a half minutes, I'll give you a sign. It's not much, but that every participant, for example, gets inroaded into what happened even before today's event. Rajula. And you have to remove your mute. I think Rajula is having some problems with connectivity. Why don't we move on and see if we can get her back? Uh, Professor Mary may just then take this, place, this space. Mary Roche from the US. Yeah. Yes, hello, hello everyone. Um, I am uh, listening and reporting back from track two, uh, and our theme was Bridging the Gap, Ethical Foundations of Online Teaching and Learning Pedagogies. And here are some things that I distilled from a very rich conversation. So the, the foundations uh, for online teaching and learning pedagogies might be human dignity at the foundation, characterized by autonomy and interdependence, a human dignity that is embodied, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual. Teaching and learning that is both person-centered and oriented toward the common good. Institutions and technologies that serve persons and communities not the other way around. Solidarity and equitable access to the goods of education. And that kind of access increasingly demands equitable and reliable access to technology. Education systems that empower learners and teachers to be change makers in society. And that is an important shift from a reductive identity of a degree seeker and for teachers, degree granters. We're founded in educational approaches that empower teachers and students to be lifelong learners. This commitment, part of our rhetoric around education, has been put to the test as many teachers have had to become students again in order to learn new technology. Uh, and so welcoming some of the disruption to sort of the power dynamics that work in a university uh, has been a challenge, but one we must meet with courage. 
and educational tech institutions, the foundation, right? Institutions with the goal of educating for both a livelihood and for living. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. This is fantastic. And definitely there will be questions coming um, later on in terms of sharing these ideas deeper because many of our participants are sending their questions already on the live chat and Christine is gathering them. We want to thank you for building the two levels of the personal and the relational, all of those categories, because this is what pedagogy, which is track two, tries to do, not just to build the soul, but both and, not either or. And this clicks also into what um, Christoph Stuckelberger tried to say initially, that we must integrate, and that's the dream I want to thank you very much. If Rajula is there now for track one, these were those who discussed um, the, vi the, 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 the vision. Rajula from India, are you there? She's reporting that there's heavy downpour where she is and the electricity is being affected. So unfortunately, we don't have her back yet. Okay, so as we keep on waiting for her, I'm sure that South Africa will not tell that story. Jeremy Pont, professor at the University of Stellenbosch, would you want to share what your team in the quality assurance and sustainability um, track discussed at the webinar in three minutes, please? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm reporting then on the uh, track that worked on quality and ethical standards in higher education. And our pre-conference presentations were really diverse, very rich in content and uh, stimulated really a lot of discussion as well. I'm going to point out three salient uh, things. First, a warning, uh, namely that tensions remain between quality and ethical standards when it comes to higher education, no less so when education goes online. Rather than the pandemic being a great equalizer, it can be over-intellectualized and the academy's silo-like existence can be perpetuated. And of course, then one misses the opportunity for interdisciplinarity and collaborative cooperation. To a question, higher education, quality and ethics are all impacted by social trends or perceptions as found, for example, in various forms of people or ge ge uh, geography based labeling. Much of this feeds into larger discursive whips within our uneven, un uh, equal world, which raises then the question, in pursuing ethics and also quality in higher education, how do we influence such discourses, such discourses perpetuating the inequality, the uh, um, unevenness? And the third and last point, uh, some, food for th some food for thought, and maybe just a tiny morsel, just a tiny small piece. If higher education is not to become a goal in itself, but to be value driven, if it is to be recognizing and working with indigenous knowledge systems, if it is to feed into sustainability broadly conceived, is or can quality then also be conceived differently? In other words, less about compliance and more about enhancement, or less about measurements and more about ethically embedded quality. Thank you very much. Jeremy, you gave us one minute. You get a handshake from me for this. <laughs> I would like to thank you very much, but you hit the nail at the head. The entire dialectics between quality and ethics, between measure and what we might call content, because the externals must not always correspond to the internals. And here we have this issue of how we can comply and yet we fulfill the rules, but the other side is not yet fulfilled. This was track three that dealt with issues of quality and assurance and sustainability. We have still two tracks to go, but I would like now to invite um, for track four, um, Professor Daniel from Argentina, Daniel Lopez. Um, you are director of Convergencia. Would you want to share what you discussed about global governance and global citizenship in three minutes? Okay. One of the main ideas 
in pre-conference sessions is education for life and not for living. But what does it mean? Uh, a life with uh, human rights, a life with mm, a great connection between nature and human beings, a life with no racism, a life with a global citizenship, and of course, but what kind of education is the other second reflection? Uh, it's um, a, an ethics education, but what that is mean too? Uh, as, um, is a, an education based on human values and human virtues? As when the old uh, Greek and Roman thinker said, and later the thinker Christian, the Christian thinkers, and in a contemporary times, philosophers as Nussbaum or Julia Adams. But uh, we need um, a third reflection. Education nowadays is a great part uh, online. But not only, not only for this pandemic period. In the future, it will be the same. So we have to develop new method for teaching and learning. It's um, a, a great um, challenge for us. Well, uh, and a final remark. Uh, our future as educator, as educator is difficult, it's very deep, but it's um, a sweet work because we are working for a new humanity. Uh, we are working for peace and human dignity, a better plan planet, a better life. So, well, it's a great challenge for us. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you, Professor Daniel. Um, you know, we have in Argentina, our globeethics.net office, <clears throat> and Eugenia will be speaking also today. I'm sure both of you are already sharing. We are also the next big speaker, Professor Dr. Rudolf Sina, who represents the Latin American continent on the board of the foundation, will be making a very powerful intervention on the contextual doc issues of visions. But what your speech brought to us is the underlining factor of what education can we give to human beings to retain their humanity? Not just to live and earn some money, but to be in synchron with nature, with ecology, with environment. This was the global citizenship track. And with that, um, we will just then now take one more, or rather if Rajula is back, we'll take the library first, and that was um, Tilotama Ray, who is also from India, who represents a Bodge Bodge Institute of Technology. Um, will you just shortly, um, Tilotana, give us um, your recipro reciprocation of what happened in the preface? Hi. Uh, we are really very thankful to globethics.net for raising such a pertinent issues during COVID-19. Uh, from the perspective of library science, I can tell that library is not only a repository of knowledge, but it is a knowledge domain where, uh, where we generate knowledge, where we preserve it, and where the information is being retrieved from different users. So we have to have go by details. We have, we have discussed that we have uh, this space, we have harvester, we have polio management. Polio management is the latest technology where we can integrate librarians work, the developers work, and the 
in this world. And this way, we can cater most of the users very efficiently, I think. And other thing, the uses of the internet throughout the world, globally, 40% people only use this internet facilities, can have access to this internet facilities. So we have to make the break in the gaps, this accessibility and the technology. We have to reach to them who are devoid of such technology, such model amenities. So I think this is the time when, where we can um, accommodate all the users in such a manner, in such a facet, that they, the users, the end users, can avail all the documents and access. Thank you so much. Chilatana, thank you very much, Ray. <clears throat> Um, again, from India, we yeah, noticed yeah, um, yeah. disruptions on the system. It's raining. I hope it's not yet monsoon time. But you gave us this very important message, accessibility to technology, even in the world of the library. And digitalization as part of that, which makes a library function. A university normally is teacher and library. If there's no resource, the work doesn't happen. So thank you very much. And Rajula, we shall try you one more time. Otherwise, the visions will be lost in the pre-conference um, session. Societal visions. Greetings from India to all who are present in this webinar. I'm grateful to the Geneva team for offering the privilege to be part of this first thematic track creating new societal visions in higher education values for living together. After listening to the four panelists going through various media reports and my personal experience and learning, I would like to share the following thoughts before this important gathering. This conference takes place at a time when the world is struck with the pandemic COVID-19 that has brought about a total change to man's outlook of life. We are experiencing across the globe physical distancing, and also hiding part of the face with masks. The priority before the nations is making their country COVID-19 free, and nations have as their topmost agenda creating new societal visions and values for living together. I would like to highlight some points given in the short time. The pandemic has created local and global stress and strain, universal and individual tensions, as well as spiritual and material tremors. Countries across the globe are struggling to address the fear, dilemmas, and unrest situations with medical care. The immediate need is to connect with the researchers, education experts, and policymakers to bring together to use the rich knowledge and experience on learning that will ultimately teach values to live together, to support each other. The first ethical challenge experienced was with the hospitals in countries that were handling persons affected with COVID-19, giving rise to dilemmas throughout the crisis as to which patient should be saved first when resources and facilities are limited. Save as many or the most urgent ones. When situations turn to normalcy, what are some of the lessons that ought to be learned from this pandemic experience related to medical ethics? There is a new bridge being built by COVID-19 between the haves and the have-nots, the whites and the colored, the educated and the uneducated without any difference. Though the virus is the same, how it affects the lives of those who are affected or different. The gaps are there between the haves and the <coughs> In a way, this yet to be conquered virus 
has acted as a leveler it has shown that understanding the equality of the human beings is very crucial higher education has to create a new societal vision to help mainly the younger generation to understand the equality of human beings and the differences the gaps make covid 19 has affected different societies in different ways there is no vaccine medicine medical facilities and also medical understanding of the disease the need of the time is to promote universal <laughs> understanding of the possible recurrent viral infections that will help to build an ethically sound humanity offering help to each other and lastly in india covid 19 has given rise to some very special socio ethical issues tens of thousands of low daily wage migrant laborers in india lost their jobs due to lockdown they had no transportation to get back to their native place so with their belongings and family they walked hundreds of miles to reach their native places they suffered hunger and pain and also death and separation how can higher education institutions in india become centers and practitioners of ethical values producing a generation of people who will be ready to help humanity in times of such needs the challenges are before us at a time when everything about the corona virus pandemic threatens even ordinary freedoms with stay at home orders real challenge before us is to build values to live together can we help higher education to mold the younger generation to rise above considerations of narrow boundaries of religion color race community and come forward to build a society rich with an ethical base the rich and the poor the educated and the unlettered the old and the young the male and the female people of the developed and developing countries or the east and the west or equal but sadly the world needs a pandemic to make us realize this reality it is time to reiterate that an ethical foundation that makes people believe in the equality of humanity is the need of the hour thank you for this opportunity to share my views and your patient listening and sorry for the disturbance it's heavy rain outside um rajula you give us and bring us joy because you have set the tempo of the first track new societal visions because we need those visions and i think an essential message of that first track is higher education has a task most of those participating at this event how do we create a vision for learning that teaches values and gives access at across levels this is great i would like to thank all those who've contributed in the listening phase now we have finished with the aperitif we are going like they do in switzerland to the second course and the second course is an elevated the other one is normally a soup the second course is something higher and then you will now start tasting the pudding which is the dessert that is still going to come but um daniel there was a question for you which you will not answer now someone said education for life not for living and he asked the question why why put not why not say education for life and for living don't answer now but we shall come to a debate later um ladies and gentlemen permit me to introduce one of the tallest among us in terms of his standing in society and he is going to speak to a topic the contributions of a confessional university for society his name is rudolf fonsena he is in brazil teaching and rudolf the maximum you may speak is 10 minutes if you give me 2 minutes you have a handshake at the end um if you are mute yourself um you will then be having the floor to address us you are professor and head of graduate program pontifical catholic parana um at curitiba Thank you. Thank you very much, Obiora. Thank you, Globethics, for the invitation, and it's a pleasure and honor indeed to be able to be here with all of you and be sharing thoughts 
on ethics in higher education in the midst of this pandemic. So the Pontifical Catholic University of Paraná de Curitiba, Brazil, PUC as we call it, is a Catholic, private, non-profit, philanthropic, communitarian university run by the Marista Religious Congregation. So uh, the university fully accredited by state authorities and open to all faith and those who profess none. I myself am professor and head of the postgraduate program being a Lutheran. So why to be Catholic is by no means a precondition to enter the university, be it as a student, administrative staff, or a faculty. The identity can be felt quite clearly through our teaching, research, and outreach. PUC currently has about 20,000 students in over 60 undergraduate and 16 graduate programs. Among its goals are, one, to promote intellectual, physical, artistic, civilian, moral, and spiritual culture. Two, to prepare professionals with a solid humanistic formation, notable by their knowledge, capable of an efficient exercise of their tasks and role with a sense of social responsibility and citizenship. And the third goal, among those whom, uh, which I quote, is to contribute towards the development of society. These values show that the university is very clear on its goals for education and formation, which go far beyond the ingestion of knowledge or a, a bankarian knowledge, as Paolo Freire would have said, in its more restrictive sense. Formation is for socially responsible citizens that are committed towards developing and transforming society. And I present what this means as I present three theses. And the first thesis is science is not done in an ivory tower, the practice of science. PUC is oriented by ethical, Christian, and Marista values and has as its mission to develop and spread knowledge and a culture of promoting integral and ongoing formation of citizens and of professionals committed to life and to the progress of society. Its motto, which I would have shown you on the coat of arms, but unfortunately it's now not visible, is Scientia Vita et Fides, Science, Life and Faith, which we can explain as the articulation between the practice of science, the impact on life, and the, and the meaning provided by and the motivation through faith. Cook seeks to promote dialogue between science, faith, culture, and life, and solidarity, forming professionals that are conscious of their human vocation in whatever they do, being guided by ethical principles. Science thus never is never on its own, but responds to demands from society and addresses the need for meaningful transformation. This is obviously especially needed in an emerging country like Brazil, which has enormous social disparities and many precarities of daily life that need to be addressed, responded to, and solved. I now pass on to the second thesis, which is there are distinct tasks, but there is mutual fecundation and cooperation between the sciences, and therefore also focusing on the impact on life. Since I joined PUC last year, after 16 years of working at the Lutheran Theological Seminary, I have noted that there is a great interest and willingness to cooperate between the different areas, the various sciences. I call all of them sciences in the German sense of Wissenschaften, that includes the humanities as sciences, rather than the Anglo-Saxon distinction between science and the humanities. Such cooperation driven by fulfilling the mission of fostering humanity and serving society has become even more tangible as the pandemic presses for an immediate response. And I shall present some of the actions performed by one or more of the graduate programs. And again, I'm sorry, I can't show you now the pictures that I had prepared for that um, towards that end. Health sciences found out details about how the virus functions and what this implies for correct treatment. Too much ventilation by the respiration machine, they found, can damage the lungs, and anticoagulation drugs must be applied, applied to avoid embolism. Health technology, together with design, developed simple, cheap, but effective individual protection gear, like shields, masks, and aprons, for doctors, nurses, police, firemen, and other, other professionals. Equipment is also provided for rack pickers, who have to continue collecting materials for recycling to have a daily income for survival. 1,000 protection items are handed out every day to such rack pickers. 
Furthermore, respiratory ventilators are produced at high functionality, low cost and fast assembly. The artificial intelligence research program developed a method for detecting COVID-19 from X-ray images, which provides a diagnosis that is much faster and cheaper than other means. Mechanical engineering developed a nanotechnological revestment of metal surfaces to avoid contamination of hospital equipment. Law is providing counseling for legal issues as well as analyzing and commenting such issues involved in the pandemic. Management is carrying out surveys to compare population behavior with public policies to test their effectiveness. It also analyzes the role of media in this process and promotes webinars on how to survive as a small and middle-sized business in the midst of the pandemic. Production and systems engineering developed individual protection equipment for health professionals in the two university hospitals using 3D printing. And finally, but uh, not unimportant, Hot Milk Innovations and Ecosystem, which is our interdisciplinary innovation institute, developed a robot that can approach intensive care unit patients to be able to interact through a tablet, which is within the robot, with their parents, as they cannot be physically visited during isolation. The humanities, namely the philosophy, theology, education, as well as human rights and public policies, cooperating with other sciences like bioethics and health sciences, are contributing with reflections and online presentations on the human being in times of COVID-19, what it means to have hope in such times, and the need for spiritual assistance of health personnel and other front workers, like grave diggers, which are usually forgotten. Uh, the Vice Rector for Research for the Postgraduate Studies and Innovation with colleagues from Artificial, Artificial Intelligence and Urban Management developed an algorithm that allows for to reasonably predict, based on data from the past days and weeks, the curve on, on infections and deaths of the next week or two, predicting the occupation of intensive care unit beds and thus the degree of lockdown needed. The local TV journal has presented this as an important contribution towards public policy and transparent information and prediction. And I come to my third and last thesis, and I will uh, comply with the time frame, I think. Yes, science is knowledge and wisdom, also time framing wisdom, right? Meaning and motivation through faith. The biblical tradition in the Hebrew Bible, as well as in Jesus's teaching and acting, says a lot about wisdom, which is put in a simple formula to know how to live. The biblical God is a God of life and of love, and theology, as Brazilian educator and public intellectual, the late Ruben Alves would have said, is a game that is played when life is at stake. Theologia é um jogo que é jogado quando a vida está em jogo. While technical and specific knowledge is needed towards leading with life and indeed to live well, it is also experience and the wisdom how to deal with everyday life that has to be valued and fostered through teaching, cooperation and empowerment within and beyond the university. Therefore, the whole academic community has been working tirelessly towards finding technological solutions as well as harvesting and showing examples of concrete solidarity that give meaning and are motivated by faith and convictions in teaching, research, and outreach. The practice of science, the impact on life, and the meaning provided by, and the motivation through faith. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, patience. Thank you, Rudolf. You used all your time. You did not donate one minute to me. But we, <laughs> no handshake. <laughs> so no handshake. No, there will still be a handshake. No, um, you just gave us a very strong word, which I think is very important. Science is not an aim in itself. It is a servant. Because we reached a stage in deconstruction theories, in empiricism, in positivism, in existentialism, where science was used and measure was used as the only key benchmark. Your university brings in scientia vita et fide into this plenary to show that science is not a master, it responds to needs. And this is very helpful in developing um, societal visions, new societal visions, for which we now call Maria Eugenia Barroso from Argentina to complement the views you have also expressed. 
Maria, your maximum is eight minutes, but you know a handshake you might get. Thank you very much, Oviora and Christine and all Globetic team. It's a great pleasure to be here. And thank you, Rudolf, for your generosity. Uh, to provide a complementary vision to his great presentation, I would like to state a question and present three points to start discussing and thinking about as the three pillars of the bridge that we need to build together. The next slide, Victoria, please. The question is, what are government, private sector, and civil society expecting or demanding from higher education institutions? The next slide, Victoria, please. During the last 25 years, the AAA leaks model developed by Henry Etzkowitz and Lloyd Leidesdorf to describe the academic industry government interaction necessary to foster the economic and social development has been used to analyze these evolving relations and also as a policy making tool. The model is based in the interaction between, up to that moment, the 90s, were relatively separate and distinct institutional spheres and their associated initial functions. Universities engage in education and basic research industries, who, which produce commercial goods, and government that regulate and provide incentives. The author initially argued that the extent of the relation between government, industry, and university depend on which component is the driving force. Initially, the government was considered the driving force. It offering incentives on one hand and present, uh, sorry, and press academic institutions on the other to go beyond the performing the traditional function of cultural memory, education and research, and make more contributions to the wealth creation. In addition, government shifted the relationships to economic institution, becoming both more and less involved. Also, this model uh, was developed in the 19s to promote economic development through improving industry and economy without considering so, uh, social and ecological aspects of sustainable development, the triple helix model has evolved. The, uh, the next slide, please, Victoria. The higher education institution has a great role in the knowledge-based community. Furthermore, since the emerging technologies did not coincide with the demands of a need of the civil society, leaving the potential impact, the civil society was included at the four elix. In this context, the university has the opportunity not only to foster the, the interconnectivity between the spheres, government, industry, and civil society, but also reinforce ethics and social values in the synergy of the system. The next slide, please. To answer my first question, I would like to start three requirements or demands and at the same time opportunities for higher education institutions. The first one is reinforcing ethics and social values through university social responsibility. The university social responsibility is a university management policy that has been developed in Latin America. It's going beyond the traditional solidarity extension and from the very unilateral declaratory commitment. It is the ability and the transformation of the university to respond to the needs of the society where it is immersed. The University Catholic uh, of the North of Ch uh, Chile and the Catholic University of Córdoba, among others, have been pioneers. And as an example of that, I could, I, it could be mentioned uh, the work developed by the Universidad Reformada de Colombia in the construction of the peace process. The university contributes to the social reinsertion of far former soldiers. 
My second point is providing transparency and credibility to the decision and policy making evidence-based policies. To explain this point, I would like to mention two examples of South America. The University Catholic of Argentina, Social Death Observatory, has published the poverty index in Argentina for several years. During the last ones, year, during the last years, sorry, journalists and political and social stakeholders, as well as society in general, have distrusted the index published by government agencies. Consequently, the poverty index developed by the Catholic University of Argentina became a valuable resource for social and political stakeholders. They started to demand it from the university. It is an example of credibility, transparency, and contributions to society that emerged from an institution of higher education. Another example is the Sustainable Development Goals Center for Latin America and the Caribbean of the Universidad de los Andes, which has recently presented the strategy A New Future, a forum to discuss the problem that the planet will face in, in coming years and to analyze impact of COVID-19 uh, on the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. The third, the third point, uh, which in a, in a way includes the previous one, is building bonds of trust inter and interconnectivity between higher education, government, private sector, and civil society. Since the international system seems to be collapsing, the building of trust relation could be the base to develop practices and strategies in response to the pandemic and to face future global challenges. This bond of trust became indispensable in the local and the global context. For instance, in the global context, skull clashes during the influenza pandemic in Australia in 2009 represent both a challenge for public health officials and limited tests for the level of trust in public official, government, and, uh, and school institutions. Trust was the foundation upon which effective response to school closure were built. In the global context, the bonds of trust among higher education institutions and the scientific community become indispensable to facilitate the exchange of information and the technology transfer to face COVID-19 and future global challenge. Let, uh, next slide, please. Even though this is a systemic vision. We shouldn't forget that the higher education institutions are also the propitious place to develop alternative imagination, creativity, and innovation. And is presented in the in the last slide, like the substance of teeny wires that conform the cables of the bridge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria Barroso. Uh, by the way, congratulations on your book that hit the press yesterday, a book on ethics and transversal dimensions, which was part of a conference held in Argentina last year. And many of you who are even participating here are part of those contributing. Um, as you were speaking, someone was already asking a question and one was a comment because we are coming to the last on this societal vision before questions and answers. Someone was asking, if you have these three demands, ethics and social values, transparency and credibility, bonds of trust as demands and criteria, this person says, it doesn't exist in my country at all. So you may have to travel to that country to bring this knowledge there. And another person was asking, how can we pick up these three demands for the building of higher education in practice? So bear it in mind, you may be answering this question when we come to Q&A. I have the singular privilege of introducing Reverend Professor Dr. Christian Anieke, um, the founder and vice chancellor of Godfrey Okoye University. He's professor of English. Um, I've known him since he was born. So um, he's gonna to speak to us um, from a university 
to an epistemic shopping mall, a post-COVID-19 higher education vision. Uh, Christian, you get not a handshake, but an embrace if you don't exceed 10 minutes. Unmute yourself. Wait, my dear. Okay. Thank you. I will not waste time. I hope I'll get a handshake and a hug. Uh, I bring you warm greetings from Nigeria. Uh, I have the topic, as Monsignor Biorica has already said, from a university to epistemic shopping mall, a post-COVID-19 higher education vision. You may be wondering what's the connection between a university and a shopping mall. Quite an interesting thing. Well, this the idea uh, came from our last conference. We had uh, the first conference on Zoom, topic e-learning. And this conference had over 500 participants. And I, as I was looking at the whole world, people connected from different parts of the world. I said to myself, a new page has opened in the history of mankind. That's actually what motivated this topic. So without wasting time so that I can get my handshake at the end, let me go straight to the summary of this. Nothing has affected human life and the epistemic space since the Second World War as much as the COVID-19 pandemic has happened. It's ripples are everywhere and will continue for some time. Human consciousness has been incredibly devoted to respond to the challenges of this novel situation. The human society must continue to respond to questions connected with the unfolding narrative of this pandemic with new visions and social values that will make the visions realizable. Higher education as a theater of human epistemic action must become visionary and responsive to a gamut of social visions in order to continue to be relevant in society. I'm enthralled, I'm enthralled by a particular higher education vision which Professor Amele, a queer of Global Six, mentioned last time during our conference, the idea of a leap from university to university. In the, in the same line of thought, my new vision of university in this paper is captured by a title from a university and a systemic shopping mall, a post-COVID-19 higher education vision. This vision, in contradistinction from pluriversity, means that a university will not only continue to celebrate its essential uniqueness, but also wear an additional look as a shopping mall for knowledge. The uniqueness of each university will rest on the altar of, of its local content besides the variety of products from different scholars that are available for sale. In this case, there will be a, there will be a singularity and hybridity, connecting with human epistemic space as well as securing a unique epistemic territory. Such an arrangement will make the values of good social living inevitable and a desideratum. Now, I will go straight a lot of time to mention just the characteristics of a shopping mall. Spaciousness, variety of offers, community-oriented nature of shopping malls, comfort provision by shopping malls, the quality of providing access to everybody who wants to come in, these are the qualities. And let me see, I'll just take two points from universe, how these values, these qualities apply to a university. A universe like a shopping mall must have a variety of epistemic offers. Universities have always done this, but the Zoom technology and similar technologies have offered us an opportunity to get the best scholars from anywhere in the world to deliver lectures in our universities. We can mount a number of courses using the best scholars in the world who will not need to travel to deliver their lectures. Travel costs, inconveniences of traveling, immigration requirements, health challenges, avophobia, odophobia, xenoglossophobia, or even xenophobia have been a great hindrance to many scholars in leaving the comfort of their homes and academic territories. Today, today, these great scholars can be engaged by universities in the world to deliver lectures online without any of these hindrances. Experienced but retired academics can be engaged by universities to increase the variety of the offers they have. Also, the emphasis in every MOU, Memorandum of Understanding between universities, the emphasis must now be that partner universities can enjoy the online classes available in each of the collaborating universities. Furthermore, on the side of students, every university must encourage them 
to shop for knowledge in other universities. Besides, universities in the economically rich countries of the world must consider fee waivers for students in poor countries to encourage them to get knowledge through the online courses available in such universities. Universities like Harvard and Oxford must stop taking a lot of money from African students for their online courses. I hope this will be carried by the media to Harvard and Oxford. From this standpoint, the value of university will now depend on how much is being offered the students from local and foreign-based scholars and how much a university is helping students to get products offered by other universities. The next point I will take on this before I go to summary, my conclusion so I can get my hand checked, is this, a university must also, like a shopping mall, be community-based. Every shopping mall, while offering a variety of products, still retains its phase of specialization, which will reflect the taste of the community. This is where the identity of the university will be underscored. Every university must define what its peculiar local content will be as a community of teachers and scholars. What researchers, what researches and studies curriculum or pedagogical approaches are peculiar to this particular university. This is where I reject the concept, concept of pluriversity, which appears to be the obliteration of the universityness, universityness of the university. A university must maintain its singularity, underscored by the prefix uni, one. Therefore, while offering a variety of epistemic products, it must maintain its singularity, its epistemic oneness, is universityness. I conclude. The COVID-19 pandemic has shaken our world, but not broken it. It has rather jolted us to a fresh consciousness of doing so many things in a variety of ways. A higher institution that understands the full semantic weight of the word adaptability will survive and transform itself. These calls for a redefinition and redesigning of a university to fly on a fascinating idea of a shopping mall. This also calls for deeper collaboration in higher institutions in a common understanding of our shared values as members of the human family, deeply en entangled in the web of our social space and collective home called us. Thank you. This is really great. You took six and a half minutes. So you get That's both a handshake and a hug. You passed that exam very well. Um, we are really grateful to you, um, uh, Professor Christian Anieke, Vice Chancellor of Godfrey Okoye University. The question I see you summarize because we are now coming to Q and A. We have some five, six, seven minutes to collect some questions for those who have presented in this first panel. Um, you are, yours has been a simple question. University, who are you? What is your identity? And shall we be singularity or shall we be plurality as university? And your linkage of a university as a shopping mall with its peculiar goods brings in one advantage which you present, COVID-19 as having shaken the world but not broken the world. It's a blessing in disguise, not just in the world of using blessing, but it has opened up other opportunities that students around the world can share. One question you ask for Oxford and for Cambridge is whether they will reduce the costs of the courses they offer to African students. And I am looking at Professor Rudolph from Sina, who if you may, you may have to unmute yourself, Professor Rudolph, to answer that question. What do you think if universities that are wealthy and rich in developed nations Actually, I should have asked that question to Angela, but get ready, Angela, you get another one. Whether you would be in a, whether they would accept that as part of sharing the values for a new societal vision. If all of us have gone online to study and online to Zoom, how much can we pay to make sure that people in disadvantaged environments also access this knowledge? Is that something that re resonates with you, Rudolf, very shortly? Yeah, surely. Uh, I mean, we are a university in a developing country, but uh, we are relatively well off in, in comparing to others. 75% uh, of the students in Brazil generally study at private institutions like mine, and they pay tuition for that. 
Now, there are scholarships and so on for the normal times, and there is a pressure now to reduce fees as we enter uh, this specific COVID situation, which is difficult on the one hand to maintain the university working and uh, reduce fees, as you can as you can realize. So this is a, a tension that is constantly being being discussed. But the university has been giving out computers to people who do not have online access. They have given um, uh, packages of internet access for those who don't have it or can't pay for it. So we try to help students in whatever way possible that they can effectively participate because we know that uh, cyberspace uh, gives us a lot of opportunities and for sharing and for access and so on, but it also is exclusive to those who do not have it. So um, we have been trying to, to not to lose anyone uh, in, in, in the home, but we know it's, it's an enormous challenge even because people have not only to, they are not only following lectures, they are also caring for their siblings, for their uh, sons and daughters, for their mothers and, and fathers. Uh, they have to work to get money. They have uh, one computer maybe for five people that have to study in the same house. So these are very practical questions that, that we have to tackle. But I can see at least in our university and also in contact with other universities in our country, we do have a lot of engagement and, and work on sharing whatever is possible and needed for, uh, for advancing uh, humanely and scientifically and technically, uh, technologically in, in this crisis. Yeah. So, so I think it's, a, it's an opportunity for all of us to learn. Uh, and I should say as a last thing, what I find important also that many, many people are anxious to say, well, when are we getting back to normal? And I think we should never get back to normal as it was before, as we knew it before. We have to go to a new normal. Uh, and universities can help us to learn how this works, you know, to see, for instance, that the ozone hole has been closing because there's much many less uh, airplanes in the air. Uh, the, the air in the, in the city is better because there's less traffic, less accidents, uh, less violence outside, although more violence in the houses, which is some, somebody has asked that also, which is something we have to tackle. So there's a number of, of issues that come up in the moment, but also for the future. How should our future look? And Yuhal Harari, and with this I will end, Yuhal Harari, the well-known Israeli intellectual, has said that whatever comes in the future less depends on the virus than on our reaction towards it. So we really have the responsibility, a lot of the responsibility in our hands. Thank you very much. There was a question that was going to you, Rudolf, but I'm going to channel it to Christian. While I already asked Maria Barroso to respond to the practical implementation of those trade demands. You had spoken in your speech, Maria, this was a question already coming from someone about ethics and social values, transparency and credibility, bonds of trust, being preconditions for, eth for higher education institutions. And the question was, how do you implement it? In one word, in one sentence, in very short words. And probably as you are thinking the answer, Christian Anieke, the question coming to you is a question that was sent for Professor C. Um, Rudolf Fonsina to answer. And that has to do with the entire thing about existence and essence. In his speech, he tried to say that science must be a good servant, not a master. Science must serve life and serve faith. But we have the contradiction in society that people believe in science as the be all and end all. And there is a dichotomy in terms of science versus the rest. So this appeal, science being a servant, will hit at the academic community where you belong also in terms of how people see science. Would you share that idea of Ciencia, Vita, and Fide as connected, because that brings the solidarity dimension. So these are the two questions that have come. You, Maria, first, and then Christian, then we will be going to a second panel. Thank you very much. And I think that this question was, uh, is related with the second question that you has already mentioned. Uh, we, uh, we are going to, how we are going to rebuild the bond of trust to facilitate a healthy global dynamic. 
these uh, two uh, questions are related, in my opinion, and I think that uh, it could be uh, promoting the network like this, like Glo uh, Globetic, which brings together and join higher education institution, research centers, and scientific, uni uh, scientific uh, so, sorry, scientific communities. We can share information, we can trust each other and, cast, uh, and could interact in a, in a, with a bond of uh, trust. I think that the, the answer of this question is in ethics and the bond of trust that should be and we need to construct or build uh, through these um, networks. Thank you very much. Christian, the last word. Thank you, thank you. I believe in friendship. Uh, I, I do not think I want to buy the idea of science serving humanity, humanities or humans. I want science like us and humanities to be friends. When we established Gulf of Korea University, we established the university on the foundation of, a, of friendship between the science, natural sciences, and us and humanities. They should go hand in hand. This idea of who serves the other, the master and the servant, it is an idea that I want to reject. Let science work hand in hand with our subhumanities. Let it too serve humanity. And that is the idea also I want to emphasize in the relationship of universe. That's why I don't want to have pluriversity, so that one university will dominate others. I want universities in the world, humans, to go hand in hand as brothers. This is the message that COVID is delivering to us. You see, there's no boundary anymore. COVID has reached everybody. All 190 countries of the world are suffering the same thing. That means there's no dominance. There's no superiority in the face of COVID. We have to work hand in hand. And that's what I want science to do. Not one serving the other, the two working hand in hand. That's actually my uh, position on this. Thank you very much. Um, with this, we will be rounding up this panel on ethics and new societal visions. We should not forget that globeethics.net is a leading global foundation that is integrating ethics in higher education. The galaxy of many of you participating at today's event shows the need for networks. Globe Ethics intends to build upon the partnerships and bring many of the consortium members together, sharing values, sharing ideas, sharing thought, and giving it to all the others. So it is a moment of solidarity. I would like to thank the panelists now. We are actually quite on time. And having taken now the questions that were on ground, and if you have questions, please use the charts to raise them. Christine will be gathering them. We want now to go to lightning talks. This is not serious talk. We've listened to serious talks. We're going to go to lightning talks of four to five minutes. And this will be done by Professor Dr. Angela Owusu Ansa of the Ashesi University in Ghana. She will be talking in a light moment. Angela gives hope. When you see her, you see hope. She will be talking about educating ethical and entrepreneurial leaders. We will be having um, the, the executive director of Arigatu International, um, that is uh, Maria Lucia Uribe from Colombia. She will be talking about the role of transformative pedagogies in fostering ethics education. We have also two more light speakers. One of them is Professor Dr. Pamela D. Couture from that beautiful country called Canada. She will be discussing, I mean, she teaches in Jane and Geoffrey Martin Chair in Church and Community um, in Emmanuel College, Toronto. Um, uh, Pamela will be discussing considerations for student and faculty vulnerability in remote delivery. Um, this is a heavy topic, but I'm sure Pamela will make it light, also seeing the time available. And the last is my own personal friend, Professor Dr. Diki Sofian from Yogyakarta in Indonesia, Indonesian Consortium for Religious Studies. Um, Diki, I'm looking forward to joining you with Board of Foundation of Globeethics.net sometime in October this year, COVID allowing. And um, you will be talking about higher education pedagogies in intercultural global conversation. So you have each. Um, four to five minutes, let me say four minutes, um, so that we can beat time, we're on it. Um, the first to speak is Maria Lucia Uribe. Thank you so much, Oviora. It is a pleasure for me to be uh, here with all of you. 
And so I will be talking and hopefully very light, not so serious, but I will be talking about a challenge and an opportunity to rethink education pedagogies that support, support the transformation of the world today. And this is based on the work of Arigat International Training Educators working with children around the world on ethics education. So the COVID-19 pandemic has presented many challenges that uh, have been discussed uh, here and during the pre-meeting. And I believe there is another challenge that at times is not highlighted or considered. The COVID-19 has clearly shown not only the disparities in education access, public and private models, quality and preparedness of teachers, students and systems, but also how, uh, how disarticulated education is from our societies, how distant education is from the realities of people and particularly of young people, and how unprepared education systems are to respond to the challenges of a wounded and unequal world. Education becomes part of the problem when it fails to address the disparities, injustices, and societal illnesses of today and tomorrow. Education should be part of the solution, particularly today when we are called more than ever to build on our interconnectedness as human beings, to work together, to activate a collective leadership and challenge the divisiveness, implicit hate rhetoric about the other, and to build a new normal that is fairer, just and helps build an ethical foundation for a new world. I would like to highlight three aspect, aspects of a transformative pedagogy for ethics education that can provide new thinking on the role of education post-COVID-19. The first one is the learning environments. As we move into online learning, educators are called to create learning environments that are sensitive to the different realities of learners and to the unequal di the dynamics of societies. This includes sensitivity to those who have experienced discrimination, violence, hunger, who have experienced distress, anxiety, and fear associated to the pandemic impact. Learning environments need to be safe for learners, not only to receive information, but to express themselves and connect their learning to the realities they live. Learning environments need to use participatory methodologies that privilege teamwork, introspection, problem solving, dialogue-based learning, and connection to issues affecting society, and that builds on learners' experiences. The second uh, one is the role of educators. The role of educators today um, has changed from being providers of information and knowledge to facilitators of spaces for learning online and on-site. They, um, uh, they become role models that embody ethical values, but also openness, vulnerability, and commitment, not just to the job, but to society. Today, when we lack global leadership, educators' leadership can fill the gap at the local and community levels. The third area is about transformations. What kind of transformations education should foster in learners? First of all, critical thinking, capacity to go beyond black and white dialogues, discern and understand the impact of our actions and the ideas and attitudes on others, and be open to multiple uh, narratives. The second is critical consciousness, conscientization, as coined by Paulo Freire and mentioned before by one of the speakers, the Brazilian educator and philosopher who led the work of uh, critical pedagogy, the capacity and possibility of the learner to realize his or, his own or her own place within a specific context and the power within to change oppressive structures. Education should empower learners to use knowledge, attitudes, and skills to transform and just systems as they have become more evident today. The third, imagination. Today, more than ever, we are called to reimagine the world Learners should be equipped to think of alternatives, make connections, and aspire to new realities where we all learn to live together with one another. The capacity to imagine is very often neglected in our education systems. Education should also challenge vertical structures of learning and encourage horizontal relationships between educators and learners. Self-driven learning is more important now than ever, as learners are called to become more autonomous, which can only happen when learning becomes relevant for their own development. 
education should lead to collective actions. What can learners do together? Not as a methodological practice for instruction, but as a model for action in education to apply what is learned to transform their societies. Lastly, above all, education should help create an interconnectedness with one another through praxis that entails dialogue, introspection, and action with one another. And this is very much an approach that fosters our spirituality, our capacity to positively relate to ourselves, to others, to nature, and the divine or the ultimate, a spirituality that helps healing and transforming. And this is what I see as the role of education to transform and create a more ethical world today. Thank you. This is light warming. It is really enlightening for the heart. And you hit the nail at the head, uh, Maria Lucia, with educators being facilitators. We were having a board of foundation meeting in Abuja two years ago, and the ambassador of the German embassy was telling us, have you heard about Ashesi University? We said, no. So when you go to Ashesi University, you see an ethics university that is online, that is on ground, that is the vision, the mission, the essence is just about growing the next generation around ethics. So we decided all to travel to Ghana. And last year, we discovered the provost and professor of Ashesi University, um, Professor Dr. Angela Owuso Ansa, whom I'm now calling to give her own light warming message. Angela, four to five minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. Uh, imagine an Africa bustling with enterprise, employment, good roads, clean cities, first class health units run by leaders of integrity who consistently make ethical choices and decisions. We did. Ashasi University in Ghana was founded to test the hypothesis that young Africans educated at the university level in a way that nurtures ethics, innovation, and entrepreneurship would become a leadership force to change for change in Africa and beyond. One African necessity less obvious is Africa's urgent need for a new generation who care about these challenges and who have the courage, persistence, and skill to address them. And so at Ashesi, we educate young Africans to stand up to corruption and bureaucracy by teaching that they must ask questions. It takes courage to ask questions and ethical courage can rarely be imposed. It is fostered through an honest exploration of values. We discuss real life examples, which often brings clarity to the consequences of corruption, such as would you want your sick mother treated by doctors who had cheated through medical school? Corruption in government officials shows up as electoral fraud or resource theft. Corruption in students takes the form of cheating. Africa needs leaders who will do the right thing even when no one is watching and who will refuse to tolerate wrongdoing in others. If students tolerate cheating now and with their peers, how will they stand up to corruption in the future? We tell our Shasi students, if you want to lead, develop your own ethical courage, then help others find theirs. Of the many ways we foster ethics, we are most known for the pioneering Ashasi Honor Code, which states, I will not cheat, nor will I tolerate cheating by others. These simple words form the heart of our Honor Code, the first of its kind in Africa. Students sign a pledge not to cheat and to report any cheating they witness. Exams are not proctored. We also teach that to be innovative and entrepreneurial, they must stop memorizing old answers and instead analyze problems in fresh ways and create new solutions. Ashasi's interdisciplinary core curriculum is designed to foster ethics and critical thinking in addition to in-depth STEM majors. Instead of traditional lecture-only classes, we offer a mix of small seminars, workshops, hands-on learning through labs, community service, and senior capstone projects. Students tackle, tackle problems based on complex real-world scenarios. Visit most African cities and you will see plenty of innovation and initiative among the children as they transform junk into toys and hustle to sell goods. Ashasi students are taught that entrepreneurial talent is not, isolated, is not an isolated quality, but is intertwined with innovation and ethics. All three qualities reinforce each other and all three require courage and skill. 
we remind them consistently that Africa urgently needs more innovators and entrepreneurs. Our population is forecast to double by 2050, yet much of Africa's infrastructure is inadequate even for today's citizens. If we rely only on existing strategies, we will not meet our growing demand in an environmentally sustainable manner. The size of this gap can be daunting. However, when we look at this challenge through an innovator's eyes, we realize that most of the infrastructure Africa needs has yet to be designed, funded, or built. There are vast opportunities to create new, better solutions. In the, de in the next decades, hundreds of millions of Africans will reach working age and will need these newly created jobs. Ashasi graduates are excited by Africa's mix of challenges and opportunities. If we revisit our hypothesis, we will see Ashasi graduates developing biometric voter ID systems, launching a successful leadership program for women in government and business, cardless banking, etc. Only 6% of youth in Sub-Saharan Africa attend college. By definition, this 6% will become Africa's future leaders. Transforming how this small cohort thinks and acts can have huge benefits. Imagine an Africa bustling with enterprise, employment, good roads, clean cities, first class, um, first class health units, run by leaders of integrity who consistently make ethical choices and decisions. I can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela. Someone was already asking the question, what's the name of this university? The name is Ashesi University in Ghana. Um, for those who are interested, um, you were quite on time and we are grateful to you. I'm sure that many other vice chancellors and people in the university would like to network with you. That's what Globe Ethics does, that networks can happen around our partnership and consortium um, relationships. We would like to, we are discussing about ethics and new pedagogies and Dr. Pamela um, from Canada will be um, taking her space now. Pamela, welcome. And of course, you know, our moments, very short time, but I'm sure you can deliver. So for this lightning talk, I'd like to remember, remind you that lightning, at least where I am, is both beautiful and it's dangerous. And it hits at a very specific point and starts fires. And that's what using role plays and experiential learning in the classroom does. Um, my particular little teeny weeny lightning talk is about the use of drama and the use of role play in teaching spiritual care. Um, and it's specifically about vulnerability of students and faculty that happens during that time. And certainly in, this, in the course of using role plays, I want to enhance human dignity I want to increase trust. I want to value the students and all that they bring into the classroom, all that they have learned in the past and can teach one another. And we want to build a community of learning. But vulnerability for these students comes from a sense of being overexposed in a new situation, of feeling a lack of control, of confusion, of stimulating guilt or shame from prior experiences denial or dismissal of their gender, their sexual identity, their culture, their race, their religious identity, their spiritual identity. And vulnerability for me has to do with my fear that I will violate something about their identity. Um, sometimes it's from my age. That age may not bring wisdom, but may just be coming from being out of touch with younger people. And the question then is how can I become part of their learning community and interact with them in such a way that we create new knowledges together. So in order to be able to create this kind of classroom environment in a remote situation, with, which I have to teach in in the fall, um, I am trying to think through what I can do remotely that I do in person and where I have to change what I'm doing. Class always begins with introductions, and I ask them to introduce themselves specifically with characteristics that allow them to pull, pull, participate fully in the class, having to do with their school, their degree program, their previous experience, where they live, and if they wish to do this and need to do this about their sexuality, their national identity, their cultural identity, their racial background, or anything else that's important for them in order to participate fully. 
we deal with very sensitive topics such as death, illness, violence, child sexual abuse, um, domestic violence, interfaith marriage, suicide, non-suicidal, uh, self-injury, mental illness, and mental health. And in the course of, the, of the, the semester, those kinds of topics have the potential to create a lot of vulnerability that students hadn't anticipated. So in order to make it possible to enter into this much vulnerability, I use a very specific process and try to make sure I follow that process very carefully. I try to reduce anxiety in the room by infusing energy, positive regard, and playfulness. That, I think, is going to be harder in a remote situation. I think that the way in which I use nonverbal communication will be difficult in, in a remote context. I try to be strength-based and avoid criticism. That I can do in a remote situation and be very consistently um, focusing on the strengths that the students are bringing. When I have them come into role plays and act out situations, they take on different kinds of roles, and I'm out of time. Uh, they take on different kinds of roles, and by having them switch out those roles, they get to experience different aspects of the situation. I have them play characters and help them take on uh, the personality characteristics of something that is foreign to them in order to be able to learn from the role, the character that they are playing. And this gives them an element of safety because then they can do some things and explore some ways in which they see people acting without being criticized themselves. And I announce that they are role playing, they are actors in this situation, but they're learning from the actors that they are learning, that they're, um, that they're playing. Students are always allowed to opt out of a role and students in a, in a, in a, um, in a, in person situation are allowed to get up and leave if the situation gets too intense. I'm worried about that in the remote situation. My conclusion is that in the remote situation to do experiential learning, I'm going to have to break things down into very small parts and to introduce small parts one by one in a sequential way in order to get to the overall goal and to introduce some creative arts into the classroom um, in which they can express themselves in multiple forms. So that's my quick lightning talk. And that was really lightning because um, dealing with vulnerabilities also for students and teachers in a remote environment showcases that on-site education was always the best. That becoming virtual human beings, you don't see, we have, we just, you, you may even end up becoming a robot. So it's now a question of what is it that the world has thrown into us? Some have seen COVID as a, an opportunity, but you are really now looking at it concretely as a classroom teacher and the points you bring are important. There are some questions coming from Maria Lucy, for um, uh, um, Angela, and of course um, for you, Pamela. But before then, we will now invite Professor Dr. Diki Sofian from Indonesia to address his few minutes with a lightning talk also. Well, hello there. Uh, thank you all. I really feel honored uh, today and appreciate Globe Ethics is, um, you know, for inviting me to this marvelous conference. I'm particularly happy to be reunited today with my good friends, Professors Oviara and Christoph. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say that one of the things that this current uh, COVID-19 pandemic has shown us is that higher education could do more in terms of providing access to education and ensuring fairness to students and learners. Not to mention the lessening uh, you know, significantly of the bureaucracy and red tape associated with higher learning, both for the students and especially for the uh, faculty members. As we have seen in the past few months, uh, anyone from anywhere can virtually learn anything and everything they desire via readily available technological platforms. Top-notch universities around the world are also offering free courses to anyone with an internet connection. Admittedly, there is this problem of digital divide and the unequal development of the internet infrastructure. But setting that aside, such painless and painless educational system 
would and should probably make us rethink about the relevance of our existing higher educational system. Currently, I'm fortunate to be part of the Globe Ethics uh, Initiative together with the Jesuit World Learning to offer new courses on inter-religious cooperation for peace, whereby learners with no or limited internet access, such as those in remote areas and refugee camps, could still have access to learning opportunities. In, I, in ICRS, I'm also developing with colleagues a, a MOOC, a massive open online course on Indonesian Islam and religious pluralism, and also another one with colleagues from different countries on faith and urban resilience. So I'd just like to focus my lightning talk on two uh, points on new learning opportunities and how we could reconnect uh, our university uh, pedagogies to the wider sort of uh, attempt at fostering intercultural global conversation. One is that we need to democratize our university classrooms and make way for various innovative ways of interaction and engagement between students and teachers or faculty members. This should extend to lectures, student research, term papers, exams, seminars, conferences, and what have you. And we have seen that during this pandemic, uh, you know, students taking their graduation and examination virtually and online. Uh, and thus online pedagogical methods allow us to make classrooms more accessible to people of different backgrounds, affiliations, to teach as well. Faculty members could invite professors, scholars and researchers literally from anywhere around the world. I mean, this used to be confined only to universities that could have the means to invite uh, and facilitate visiting professors to have their sabbatical or leave of absence from their universities. But as we all know, Professor, uh, as Professor Anika was saying, visiting professorship schemes are rather expensive, right? So with geography being a non-issue with online pedagogy, you know, global education could be achieved with a fraction of the cost. So this brings us to the concept of classroom without walls, as some of the friends from India uh, have also initiated. So with the new online pedagogies, we can literally invite professors, scholars, and researchers from any institutions around the world, you know, from different kinds of nationality, race, religious affiliations, and including disciplines. It also allows our students to think uh, beyond the textbooks and explore non-dominant, often, more often than not, Western theories and methods of knowing. And so in the conventional university system, we talk and argue a lot about learning outcomes. Well, what do you really mean by learning outcomes if, if not the totality of the experience that students or learners get from the process of learning? And so uh, I'm arguing this point, not just from the methodological viewpoint of teaching, but also epistemologically speaking, such totality of inclusive learning experience would indeed bring about a more inclusive, responsible uh, citizenship that we all desire. After all, human civilization expects people to contribute one way or another to their society or to human progress. And the last thing I would just say is that we are now currently living in the age of synthesis where, you know, if you look at the problems of the world today, that uh, no problem of humanity today can be really um, resolved by one discipline or one nationality. So with this, I, I end my lightning talk and will be happy to answer any uh, questions which you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dickie. And you were quite on time with your panelists, uh, all, all of you. Who have spoken, Maria Lucia, Angela um, Owusu, um, Pamela from Canada, and of course yourself from far away, Indonesia, we might call it a continent of its own. And, but there are issues that have been raised, and Maria Lucia, you got a lot of questions and interventions. The key thing being um, the entire context of what education in this time must be. You have already said it, but it might be good for Pamela to address the questions raised to you. Because Pamela, 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 I mean, Angela tried to bring out the issue of, for the African continent, train people into the future who are useful for that context in terms of entrepreneur, in terms of leadership, and in terms of skills, all founded around ethics. Um, would you see, Maria Lucia, that what Angela's Ashesi University is doing 
corresponds already to what you are advocating? That would be a question for if you unmute yourself, because she has just said, these are the kinds of things they want to do. You are doing education for children, but they are now also into higher education. So where is that synergy? She says, for example, our students don't have anybody supervising them in exams. They don't cheat, but we don't control them because we trust them. Mm. Exactly. Uh, Obviola, I was actually thinking, I was responding on the chat to someone asking what concretely uh, we can do to promote critical thinking. And Angela was just describing all the things they do in the university to promote critical thinking, which is so important nowadays. So she was talking about problem solving, uh, collaboration, dialogue, allowing uh, uh, the learner to ask questions. And I think that is what education should be. It's about dialogue, it's about asking questions, it's learning from what the other uh, says, what the other narrative. And I think very often, particularly in societies where uh, we have a lot of uh, divisions between different groups of society, there is not much opportunity for dialogue. And, 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 and I think that is where critical thinking starts happening because we start seeing the other with a different light. We will start seeing problems with different eyes. And I think what was, Angela was describing is that creating this environment where the learner is free to ask questions, where the learner engages in dialogue, where the learner doesn't have to be told what to do because develop this autonomy, develop the, the learner, it's already motivated and self-driven as I mentioned in my, in my talk. So I, I see very much the connection, I'm very glad with the work that Angela is doing. We do this work with children, but of course we train the educators that are working with children and precisely on how to embody all this because you cannot transmit ethics and cannot transmit all this if the educator doesn't understand all this and doesn't, doesn't embody it. So yeah, I see all the synergies. Uh, Obiora, and, and I think there are others, someone was asking about how do you change the attitudes in, in the students? And I think all what Angela was saying is precisely that. I think we, we, don't, we cannot change the attitudes in, in the students. What we can do is to offer an environment where the learner feels more connected to participate and that changes their attitude, not us trying to change the attitude. It's the environment and it's the, the, the role modeling also of the teacher. The role of the teacher is critical. I, I leave it there for others to, to join the conversation. <laughs> well, Maria, by saying that you have just joined into what Dicky said lastly in terms of democratizing the education world. But there is a question for Angela. I mean, your university in Ashesi, there is code and students pledge and sign a code. What does that mean? And this code says a lot. Would you want to share it more? Someone wants to know deeper about what is the code they sign. Angela, are you there? Can you unmute yourself? Okay, so as we are hoping that you will answer that question, we go now to Pamela, where there has also been some reflections about the remote delivery and the challenges um, teachers and students have in terms of the negatives of a virtual education. And you are bringing it into the context of how do I impart values when I am digital? I mean, where do we meet? How can values happen without um, concrete meeting? And you have dramatized that very, very strongly. And it might be good just to deepen it more with two, three sentences about the consequences of that virtual education. Yeah, one of the things that we know university-wide at the University of Toronto is that if, as we went uh, um, into remote teaching in the spring when COVID came up, the incidence of harassment in online environments also increased. And one of the things I think professors have to be trained in and be prepared for is interrupting incidents of harassment when they occur and stopping them on the spot. Um, what's interesting and what I've, when, as I've tried to think this through of how my own teaching is going to change um, in the fall with the, with the particular group of students I have, Part of the situation I had in the in-person situation is I could do a lot of modeling of what I expected from them 
in terms of speaking with good communication practices, eye messages, respecting um, other students, making sure they were using good body language one toward one another, that sort of thing. I think that's much more difficult in a Zoom environment. And I'll be basically in a Zoom environment like, just like this. And so the question of how we contract at the beginning of a class in order to help students respect the dignity of each other and listen more carefully, um, and whether or not we use discussion boards where there tend to be more free flowing, flowing comments that may be more destructive, or whether we require people to be face to face so they have to claim their own, um, their own thoughts. The other thing that we're learning is that we have to make sure that students sign on with their own names and not allow them to use aliases in, an, in a Zoom environment so that they have to be responsible for what they're saying and what they're doing. So there's a few things like that that we're learning about this rapid transition that I've, got to, I've really got to think through. The other comp component is that in terms of creating this community of learning and democratizing the classroom, and I'm totally with the two, the three other speakers I'm, I'm, I'm a, a, a part of on this panel, on that, the, the issue of debriefing any experiential activity. So if you use an experiential activity, so you use a video in the classroom, you use a role play in the classroom, you use anything that is going to, to stimulate people's uh, emotional life in addition to their intellectual life, there has to be an opportunity for debriefing that. Otherwise, you let them go away with a lot of emotions that they have to express someplace else. And you have to have a ritual of some sort for, for containing that and, and expressing it in, a, in appropriate ways. So the question for me, as I think this through with my teaching team this summer, will be how do we allow students to debrief the experiences and do that in such a way that they don't end up harming each other. And we have some serious thinking to do about this uh, and making sure that what we, what we do in an experiential situation, so using case studies, using role plays, using, using um, um, you know, problem solving skills, that kind of thing, what we do in those situations help to increase connectivity of students with one another and decrease the potential for harm with each other. And the potential is there. It's big. And this is this is very enlightening. I mean, you are just giving hope. The potential is there. Um, someone yeah, the potential is there. there. The potential is there. That's the word. Um, Diki, um, you were speaking about um, the the ICRS, the in Indonesian Consortium for Religious Studies, and you did mention the Jesuit Worldwide Learning and its work towards um, addressing people on interreligious dialogue. You have spoken about the dimensions of globeethics.net collaboration. You've spoken about using um, the MOOCs to reach to Islam and to faith and urban resilience. Someone says, can you say more about the work of higher age? I mean, because eventually it's all about um, the age of synthesis, which goes beyond methodology and pedagogy, it's completeness. So what someone wanted to understand more the Indonesian Consortium for Religious Studies and how this holistic approach um, comes into form. Well, again, I just like to reiterate what I said in my lightning talk, which is that no uh, problem of humanity today can be resolved by one discipline, one science, one nationality, one race, one whatever. Right? And you think about climate change, you think about uh, this COVID-19 pandemic, you think about food energy, uh, uh, food security or energy security and, and what have you. None of these problems could be resolved by one discipline or one science, right? Uh, or one group of scientists, so to speak. So there needs to be a more sort of holistic understanding of reality, more sort of this multi-inter and transdisciplinarity in the way we look at human problems. Uh, and I think this is where we are at. This is where the argument on the age of synthesis comes in, where we need to collaborate more. And I think one of the uh, things that we learn through history, through the passage of history, is that different nations, different races, different countries and regions have their own ways of knowing 
their own ways of doing things, you know, to resolving problems uh, that they are facing. And so I think this is one key point in our um, sort of philosophy of education in ICRS as well. We are very open, we are very inclusive, we invite a lot of uh, scholars uh, from different religious backgrounds, from different disciplines to come to teach uh, in our um, PhD program. We have students from 15 different countries, from different uh, religious backgrounds, and we're developing MOOCs and online courses for different, uh, you know, sets of um, specialities. And so, you know, um, this has been one of our strengths, I think, uh, in the development of, of our program. And I think we would like to see more of this uh, sort of crossbreeding of disciplines and crossbreeding of uh, intellectual uh, exchanges between and among scholars of different nationalities and religions, ethnicities, and, and what have you. Unmute yourself, Obiora. Great. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, this panel. It was a lightning speech, lightning talk but you really expanded the scope of our knowledge with your contributions. Don't forget, I mean, I'm sure some people may want to leave before the end, but there's gonna be a prize and an award towards the end. We're going to give some awards and we're gonna give, of course, certificates to all of you who have made papers and presentations, especially the panelists. But there is a large galaxy of those who are participating in today's events who had indicated based on our inquiry earlier on whether they will want to receive some um, certification or whatever is going to happen. Um, so the digital poster virtual paper award ceremony will be handled by the, um, the Dean of um, GlobeEthics.net, the academic Dean, Professor Dr. Amele Ekue. I'm sure some of you will still have, we're going now to the last and final stage of today's event. And um, permit me now to introduce panel three and panel three deals with quality and sustainability, where ethics inroads them. And someone from the end of the world, I think that's where the world ends. After that, there's nothing else, the Fiji Islands. And that's um, Professor Dr. Upo Lumavai. We thank you once again for being present and for taking your time. I don't know what time it is. It must be 4 or 5 a.m. there. Um, welcome, you are speaking to um, ethics of eco-relationality from an oceanic perspective to a global conversion. And with you is Jenna, Jessica, again from RITA. Um, she is Assistant Director of Research um, in the Maluku. Jenna, you've been very active in the seminar I had last week, and I listened to the lifestyle of people from Maluku. Um, you will be having six to eight minutes, Jenna, whereas um, Professor Upol Luma, we give you two minutes extra for waking up at 4 a.m you will be speaking to your topic. Please take the floor. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Club Ethics, for the great opportunity and um, am and, and honored uh, to meet brothers and sisters online, uh, especially uh, from the Pacific Ocean. Uh, I'll be speaking today about uh, eco-relational ethics. Uh, note that my position includes the word eco, uh, to move beyond a human-centric idea of ethics and education to include uh, relationality of the whole. Uh, let me share with you uh, parts of my presentation. Uh, do you see the presentation? We see your presentation. Okay, yeah, thanks. Right. Uh, so what is relationality? Um, in the oceanic uh, relational philosophy, um, all of life is an assemblage of relationality. Uh, therefore, relationality is in our blood. Uh, we came into being through relationships, and it is through us and in us that relationships continue. Um, relationality underpins all values and practices of oceanic indigenous communities. Life is constituted by flows of intensities of relationships. Hence, movements of relationships are neither rigid nor, nor static. 
Therefore, in indigenous uh, people, um, peoples, as indigenous peoples, we don't just understand. We understand reality and life according to the rhythms of relationships. We interpret life according to the structures and dynamics of relationships. In other words, relationality is the hermeneutical key to understanding life and well-being. It underpins the structure of knowledge and shapes the culture of learning. Eco-relationality argues that um, everything, meaning all of life, is complex, yet interconnected, sacred, dynamic, and fluid, and of course, living. Eco-relationality is wrestling to understand the individual as part of the community, and the community as imaged in the, in the, in the individual. Relationality is the whole, the sum of unity and distinction, connection and difference, communality and individuality, life and death, secular and sacred, and the list goes on. A relational ethical person is one that should have the holistic grasp of both. Okay. Um, so let me, let me, um, just, just look at four ethical strands of relational ethics or eco-relationality. Because of the time limit, I will be discussing only four strands, uh, especially the challenges, and how these four might contribute to strengthen online ethics and quality um, and sustainability. Um, for, uh, first one is complexity and multidimensionality. Eco-relationality is an ethics of complexity. Uh, it deals with navigating multiple strands of life, multiple dimensions of being and becoming. So it goes against a kind of single stranded linear way of thinking. Most students in the Pacific grew up in oral cultures, for example, or orality is uncomfortable with a single linear one truth way of thinking because it deals with complexity with how people navigate complex structures, relationships, and systems of life that usually starts in communities and not in classrooms. The question is whether mainstream education is willing to take on oral stories and traditions as part of quality learning and standards. Well-being, quality, and sustainability depends on this navigational process. Oral stories, for example, do not promote central characters but rather all characters and faces are brought to the fore to be recognized and acknowledged in a storyline. So education in this respect has an allness mindset as opposed to a oneness mindset promoted by the gospel of uniformity. This philosophy teaches learners about adaptability to complex situations, to changes and new challenges such as the COVID-19 especially shifting from traditional to modern, modern, and, of, and in our case, face-to-face -to, -face to online platform. In a say, it is the same tool used by Pacific Island communities to respond to climate challenges. It pushes their resilience and finding new possibilities of growth through navigating complexities, igniting critical consciousness and analytical engagement. Of course, the challenge is still there, as many of them grew up in tight relational cultures and contexts of face-to-face -face relationship is lost. Relationality is the same tool used to navigate the complexity of the new normal. Perhaps we need a theology of education to shape a values-based ethics of education, to challenge this monarchical God that continually shapes our theological educational ethics. Relationality can assist online learners to move away from this one way of doing things or the correct normal in the education system to have a broader perspective of what we mean by best practices. It encourages students to shifting boundaries of spaces of learning and thinking to achieve life and, and well-being. Interconnectedness, the second one, that all of life are connected. The notion of mutual inclusiveness um, is critical to knowledge and learning in the Pacific, 
I am in the community and the community in me. I am in the land and the land is in me. So it, a, it, it promotes a kind of we are logic um, as opposed to the we have logic that underpins neoliberal development. Um, one of the challenges of online learning moving to another kind of online connectedness. Uh, whether the learners will lose the, their community and relationality that is so key to specific people's well-being is a discussion for another time. However, relationality, especially in a notion of inness, the community is continually part of the individual as he or she enters the online world. That is because the individual carries his or her community, including the land, ocean, ancestors, and so forth. As we say in where I come from in Samoa, home is always a carried home. We carry our home with us. While this does not work on, for all people, the challenge is to find ways to promote a sense of holistic well-being on online platforms. And there is no simple answer to this. The, cancel, uh, the question that will need uh, to be addressed um, on how relational values key to well-being change if shifted to online platforms. Hence the struggle of striking the balance, for example, between individuality and commonality, or in our case, standards and well-being, face-to-face and online, is critical to online ethics. A false relationality holds on to just one aspect of this, this notion of oneness. Quality assurance should not just be about compliance and standards, but also about well-being and community. This is why creating a well-being environment is, of education is key to success. Um, the third one is fluidity. In eco-relational ethics, life is always fluid. This is because relationality does not focus on institutions and policies Although they are very important, it focuses on peoples and deep connections. In other words, education is a relationship, not a mere academia, at least from a relational perspective. Now again, how will this relationality enhance as we move to online learning? I ask this question because in the Pacific, sustainability, whether under the challenges of climate change or COVID-19, or in the educational arena depends on deep relationships and connections with each other, with the land, with cultures, and with spiritual traditions, not on money and institutional systems. Life and well-being is dependent on the we are culture, not on the we have cultures promoted by capitalist idea of growth. Because of the fluidity of life within relational structures, learners and encouraged to shift from the must-be philosophy that is promoted by the single-stranded approach to a let-be philosophy of life. The must-be philosophy focuses on institutional policy, institutions, policies, uh, compliance and standards of excellence. The let-be philosophy focuses on people and learners and multidisciplinary integration and relationality. It allows learners to discover with others, to be dynamic and creative, to learn and to live, even outside of what is normalized and conventionally approved. Um, now the, uh, the last one um, is spirituality. Uh, let me just uh, go straight, uh, uh, quickly on this. Relationality is the matrix of spirituality. Spirituality functions within the flow of interweaving of bodies, language, art, culture, movements, relationships, and so forth. Spirituality is the recognition and realization that there is a sacred and spiritual world beyond everything we see. That trees, land, ocean are spiritual beings that have their own world, values, race, and economy. They are capable of relating and living that the world is a spiritual household that only has life through interactions and care. Recently, I published an article um, titled, We Are, Therefore We Live, Pacific Equilational Spirituality in a Changing the Climate Change Story. I argue about the huge gap in the current 
climate change narrative and of course the educational narrative where spirituality and relational values are sidelined. Um, if you're working to assist specific people who are at the front line of climate change, then at least recognize their relational values and ethics that are central to their well-being. In other words, spirituality speaks of the well-being of uh, the whole, not just the human dignity, but also perhaps life dignity, including communities and the earth. The challenge is how online platform enhances this relational, interconnected, and holistic spirituality. And that is the challenge we have in the Pacific at the moment. The challenge of moving from what we call the VA into a digital VA, the, the relational spaces of people in communities into a digital VA. And uh, it challenges also our, 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 our conception of time because Pacific uh, students, uh, they, they like to postpone things. They are very bad with, with deadlines. Uh, but the challenge here is, um, well, it can be slackness, but sometimes also these students delay things because they engage with a process of consultation uh, with, with, with the whole community, uh, which is why just to end this uh, uh, um, presentation, that in the educational philosophy, we need to move from teaching to mentoring approach, um, where we, we uh, the later the mentoring approach allows us to learn enough, to learn that we do not know enough. Uh, students are encouraged to write their own story rather than given the story, make their own decisions and responsible for their commitment without being policed and controlled, find their passion and sustainable path in the complexity of online learning. Um, and that is the, the four aspects of, um, of um, eco-relational ethics. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uplo, Upolu, Vai. You took two extra minutes, but that's what we can allow the Fiji Islands. So <laughs> thank <we> you. <laughs> sorry for that, I'm really sorry. Canada is far, but we still see them as very near, you know, but um, when you have to deal with Fiji, you know, you, you land only on water, nothing else. Now, thank you for your presentation. Somebody's already asking a question, differentiate between spirituality and religiosity. Bear it in mind as we move on. Um, we want to invite um, Jessica. Jessica, you have six minutes. Um, Jessica, it was good to listen to you last time, so you can make it shorter because your interventions and all the interventions by the way are coming out in a new publication, in a book, which we will have people read and also online and, and use for resource material. Jessica, make it short. You have the chair. Thank you, Obiora. Thank you, Club Ati. Uh, it's my honor to join this event. Hello everybody around the world. So I will present the paper under the title, Knowledge and Empathy, A Fresh Perspective from indigenous people on sustainability in Maluku in higher education. So I will go straight and, and read uh, my salient point from the slide to save the time. So um, in the first slide, slide, you see Maluku province is next to the Papua, which is consists from uh, 1,340 1, islands. Um, ethnic dominance is Melanesia, mixture, Malay, Arab, Sam. European. Uh, I start with why ethics in the next uh, slide. Why um, ethic quality and sustainability is important on higher education? First, because uh, reliable education must have goals for the formation of character and future life. Education must be able to protect, preserve, and care for life, not only for the present, but also for the future. In the COVID-19 time, is a change for our learning that the old um, education system and their method must be re-evaluated. One of the advantages um, on online education is that creates equal opportunity to everyone with note because we are island uh, province, that infrastructure and facility in every island and region are supportive. Online education, must be able to have transparency in learning and be able to reach the space 
of life that has been very limited in traditional classroom. One of them is community-based learning. This is form of uh, learning. It's very su substantial because those students learn from communities that have been marginalized in the matter of education because they are considered as primitive. So the community has much about sustainable living and this is proven by their way life that is able to be harmony with nature. Substantial learning is able to bridge the space of the difference by presenting a real context because context recognition is very important in substantial learning. By knowing the context, students not only have knowledge and learning, learn about the values of life and uh, the dream of the group or community, but also participate in building empathy through this um, introduction. From in the next slide, from the community-based learning, I present a Maluku culture known as the Adat and as understanding at core of the Maluku people identity, uh, Maluku culture foundation, life order and legitimacy of personal and group identity in Maluku. General uh, agree in Maluku by all Maluku, the aim of the Adat is to harmonize and good order of life in the present and future. Maluku nature is manifest, manifested in the group and personal existence. Mountain, land, sea, and group are complete, even individual, are a complete picture of Maluku people. The consequences of uh, damaging the nature of Maluku means um, damaging the person or individual and group. This understanding a characteristic become a real contribution to understanding environmental ethic and a contribution to building a sustainable education. Um, I will present in the next uh, slide uh, the element in ADAT. Um, I, I love to describe uh, on the diagram so it can be easy to understand because for me it's also com very complex. So you will see uh, five element in Adat um, is Kewang, Sasi, Tanua, Tishinagi, and Ela. You will see those five elements with a different function but they, and, and also different uh, spatial tasks, but they have some goal. The, the, the mind, the, the, the goal is uh, to get, take care of creation. The implementation of the five elements in the next slide in this custom produce a number of philosophy of life that arise uh, to illustrate how education that is sustainability in indigenous people not only build knowledge but also empathy which is an uh, important part of the value of life and sustainability of life. Uh, knowledge and empathy become the basic core in the implementation of ADA or Maluku culture. Uh, the next slide, the philosophy of life produced by ADA, we will, uh, about, we will see about four philosophy. The first one is in Indonesian language or in Ambon Malay language, so what you feel, I feel to, to love each other. It's about kinship between the two communities to always live in peace and helping one another to recognize that the two communities original came from an ancestor, one ancestor, uh, is also personal identity that is intertwined with a uh, community and nature. What you feel, I feel too. It means what you, your identity, your community, your nature feel. I, as an individual community nature, feel too. The second one is Tanuar, knowledge about the circle of life. Nature is seen as a fellow. Tanuar is also understand as the knowledge, balance, and empathy. Uh, the third one is uh, ability to nanaku, orientation and adaptability, ability to have traits and adapt adaptability, to remember the lifestyle that we are live in the midst of nature and also as an island people, it's a small, small island. Local uh, nanaku is also a wisdom of Maluku people to overcome climate change. The fourth one, Maluku people have a ability of kalesan. Kalesan is thoughtfulness and ability to cope 
whole perspective both uh, for the person, the community, and nature. Someone who is kalesang, who is able to love each other and to care. So in my conclusion, the first perspective on sustainability for higher education in time like this that can come from a local island is the insight of education as a holistic endeavor. Education as an immersion into a way of living one life in harmony with nature and empathy and responsible for the future generation. The purpose of higher education resides exactly here, offering all generation a vision for life that has future from within the wisdom of the past and present. Thank you. This is really excellent. Um... Um, from Indonesia, from the Maluku people. And this is um, a big contribution to the holistic dimension of what Globe Ethics try to teach in terms of empowerment, transformation, holistic approach, integrity, sustainability, and competence. You've just led us into the Maluku as also bringing in this. There has been a question rolling around among the chatting lobby on relationship between spirituality and religion. Probably um, um, someone may have to address that towards the end. We now go to the last two speakers, and these will be addressing ethics and responsible global leadership. So and that will be um, Professor Dr. Kanan Kitani, all the way from Japan. I've seen you, Dr. Kitani, even in the last presentations last week. You've been very, very active. And you will be talking to higher education and awareness of global citizenship. And Professor Dr. Esther Mombo from Kenya, from St. Paul's University, one of our um, um, uh, agreement consortium members of Globe Ethics Net, you will be speaking about ethics of inclusiveness in higher education. Um, Dr. Kitani, you have six to eight minutes, and Dr. Esther, you have eight to ten minutes. And we hope that we can keep to time so that we are on course. Welcome, Kitani. Okay, thank you for your introduction. Uh, I will share my uh, screen. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Right. Um, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. And my name is Kanan Kitani, as introduced. I'm from Japan, so it's midnight, almost 12.30 in Japan. It's way past my bedtime, but I cannot complain it uh, in front of Apollo from Fiji. Um, I am a full-time faculty member of School of Theology at Doshisha University in Japan. And I'm actually also a full-time graduate student at Kyoto University studying environmental studies, focusing on climate change communications at churches. Basically, I'm trying to develop a theological framework of the current environmental problems. And I have been meditating on the conference theme, building new bridges together, especially wondering about building bridges between whom, how can we build bridges together? So my presentation today will be focused on these two questions. Uh, for the last several months, I have been offering lectures uploaded on YouTube. So basically I am a YouTuber now. <laughs> I recognize that it has been a challenge for higher education to consider how to offer quality education to the students who have, for example, hearing impairment, visual impairment, or autism spectrum disorder. Um, I have a student with hearing impairment in one of the courses this semester, so I have to pre-record my lecture and add a closed caption for all the videos I produce. So it looks like this. And it is a big challenge and commitment, but clearly uh, we have to be mindful of those who need special care during, during this COVID-19 situation. But on the other hand, there are countless learnings we earn through the COVID-19 situation, especially in the field of higher education. The biggest takeaway is that we can teach and learn without physically meeting in classrooms. And I stress that this part, that due to online education, waste production at schools has dramatically reduced. Previously, the waste bins at my university where I teach were always piled after the lunch break. And I see cleaners collecting trash, 
sorting them out by hand twice a day. A reduction in carbon footprint is also an added plus. You know, higher educational institutions are one of the biggest emitters of CO2, it's especially those universities offers uh, graduate um, schools. The problem of waste production in universities is that we pro produce mixed waste that 80 to 90% of the waste cannot be recycled. And those mixed waste product produced in Japan, uh, the US, Germany usually ends up exported to Asian countries. And this practice is identified as environmental colonialism or eco-imperialism. In this article I posted here, uh, it is mentioned that as waste colonialism to specifically articulate the waste trade between the de developed countries and emerging countries. And usually many of the waste imported, uh, many of the waste import countries lack the proper facilities to recycle. So instead resort to landfills or just throwing away into oceans. So it is said that um, seventh continent is forming in the Pacific. It is called Great Pacific Gar Garbage Patch. It's unbelievable. It, it is a collection of plastic afloat in the Pacific Ocean. And thus contaminating the, contaminating the ocean and marine lives. And a political theorist, Iris Marion Young, says that this kind of environmental issues are basically structural injustice. And I quote, structural injustice exists when social proce processes put large groups to uh, large groups of persons under systematic threat of domination and deprivation of the means to develop and exercise their ca capacities. At the same time that these processes enable others to dominate or to have a wider range of opportunities for developing and exercising capacities available to them. Because the unsustainable condition of the earth is the consequence of a crisis of values, environmental protection and sustainable development will only be achieved by providing profound religious education. And on this account, World Council of Churches also recognized it as an irrefutable moral duty to discern that ecological degradation are basically affecting the most vulnerable populations. And in Laudato Si, Pope Francis puts crucial emphasis on the strategic relevance of environmental education and on the important role Christian communities play. And I will just read the highlighted part. It's too much, so I will just read the highlighted part in red. Um, the first is that ecological education needs educators capable of developing an ethics of ecology. And second, ecological education can take place in a variety of settings at schools, in families, in the media, in catechesis and elsewhere, and maybe online as well. And all Christian communities have an important role to play in ecological education. It's almost time, so I will go back to the um, the first questions I presented. The COVID-19 situation taught us several lessons. One is that we have to be mindful of those who, who require special care, especially the students. It's the bridge we have to build. And second, online education reduces carbon emissions and waste productions from schools. It will contribute to form kinder society to the environment and people. So it's the bridge we have to build between wealthier countries and less privileged countries to overcome structural injustice. And third, it is the future potential of online international education realized in this conference. This is the bridge we already have built together uh, here on this online platform. The question is that, how do we keep this bridge we have built together? And I propose that why not utilize this platform and offer faith-based education, hopefully offered for free, and for hopefully touch uh, on the topic of environment so that we can share our resources and also raise awareness of the issues such as structural injustice and grow together as global citizens. Thank you very much. 
and Professor Kanan Kitani, your invitation is welcome. How mm -hmm. do we keep the bridge? Uh, you can be yes. sure that we shall be coming to you to follow up on that discussion going forward. First, faith-based education around the environment. Globe Ethics is interested in this topic. The last speaker now is Esther Mombo from Kenya. Esther, um, please take the floor from St. Paul's University. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this seminar. And I'm sorry that I didn't participate in the pre-conference due to uh, my current uh, work. But I come from St. Paul's University, and we are uh, uh, a Christian university, and we our mission is for global service. And we are here to develop servant leaders by imparting skills and value for value through creative methods of education, research, and spiritual formation. I'm proud to say that one of our graduates is Christoph, and so you can see the good work that he is doing in globe ethics. COVID-19 has tested each part of the globe and exposed us to note that all are vulnerable, even though some are more vulnerable than others. The poor, the rich, the young, and the old, and all races and ethnicities name them. Each nation's backyard has been exposed by COVID-19. We know who is who in this pandemic. We know the strengths and weaknesses of us all. COVID-19 has brought a major disruption to the education sector, forcing higher education to take teaching and learning to online platforms. Prior to COVID-19, online education was considered an option for the minority. However, due to the timing of COVID-19, many institutions, including mine, have turned to the digital forms of learning. While this is good, we also note that online teaching and learning has brought to the fore certain deficiencies that existed prior to COVID-19, especially issues around access and inequalities, which is an ethical issue, not all are able to realize the fruits of online learning. Allow me therefore in this space to say just a few things on what I think is the topic that was given to me, ethics and skills for global citizenship or responsible global citizenship, where I've talked, I want to talk about uh, ethics of inclus inclusiveness in higher education. First of all, all of us have been talking about global citizenship, which is a problematic word. Whether we are talking about one continent or the whole world, that is still problematic. Even though we are talking about bringing knowledge and skills that human beings have to use for issues around justice, or issues around inclusivity. Global citizenship is not only about keeping the positive aspects such as justice and peace, but is also about respecting all kinds of all human beings irrespective of their nationality, color, race, ethnic, religion, among others. One of the common things that, that COVID-19 has brought to light that I'm sure has been mentioned and I'll mention it, which is common among the rich, the poor, among the strong and among the weak is the notion of, the, is, is the, the, the plight of those that are being violated. The common thing in the global uh, world is the fact that there are those that are facing a lot of violence. I was looking at the report, the UNDP report, and this was noted. 
gender-based violence increases during every type of emergency, whether economic crisis, conflict or disease outbreaks. Pre-existing toxic social norms and gender inequalities, economic and social stress caused by COVID-19 pandemic, coupled with restricted movement and social isolation measures have led to an exponential increase in gender-based violence. Many women are in lockdown at home with their abusers while being cut off from normal support services. Because we are looking at higher education, I was wondering how violence against women in higher education is going to be reflected in the digital learning. I'm sure that while in the normal learning, violence in higher institution, especially against women, has been rampant, and we see that in the news most times. Now that they are not in higher institutions, I'm sure wherever they are, like other women, they are being violated. While I'm not talking about this, I'm talking about ethics for responsible global citizenship. This is one of the aspects that will make or break us in our global citizenship. COVID-19, therefore, is an opportunity to re-examine our teaching and our learning by allowing us an opportunity to reimagine and reorganize the academy so as it is relevant for the local and the global uh, uh, world. It has given us an opportunity to challenge, to, to face the challenges and also to seek for lasting solutions. So therefore, in terms of COVID-19, and responsible citizenship of the globe. One of the things that we are looking at are issues around access, issues around uh, the digital divide, issues around sustainability, issues around approaches, issues around uh, 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 changes of the spaces in which we teach. So how do we get out responsible uh, leaders or responsible uh, 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 people in this globe. In rethinking higher education and ethics, I want to say that it is important for us to continue re-examining and reintegrating virtues of ethics and common good in the higher education teaching and learning. The theoretical approach is to consider the integration of virtue ethics and the common good as a framework to guide the teaching and learning of all programs in higher education. The integration of virtue ethics and common good as an underlying philosophy of higher education programs and process would strengthen the teaching and learning of ethics and thereby address the deficiencies prior to COVID-19 and those that are going to be post COVID-19. Taking the example that I talked about, the whole issue of violence against women, which has been normalized sometimes in higher education. How do we approach it and how do we deal with it? So what skills am I bringing to light in terms of looking at this post COVID-19. We have talked as though it is all smooth, but I do want to say that it is not smooth. It is a context in which we are all going to learn. For global citizenship and for responsible leadership, we are going to rethink and ask, accept the issues around multiculturalism the diversities that continue to be in our societies. We are going to rethink our cross-cultural awareness 
we are going to appreciate the diverging, the, the, the diverging contexts. We're going to be sensitive, sens sensitive to and to respect the other cultures. Pre-COVID-19, we do know that we have continued to be under colonial and imperial and neo-colonial tendencies that have treated others as exotic. Post-COVID-19, to be responsible citizens in the global world, what we are going to look at is not to treat others as exotic. We're going to reimagine to destabilize the sources of power between nations, between people, men, women, and others. Secondly, we are going to think through issues around being respectful and also being empathic. Em empathic. Respect our collaborations and networkings so that it is not power over, but power with, whether it is between nations or between people. Secondly, we want to look into issues around being responsible to ourselves and to others, but much more so being responsible to looking at critically at local issues, which are also global issues, <clears throat> and especially issues around violence, gender-based violence for that matter. Being ethical and empathetic is bringing to light as leaders aspects that are uh, aspects of care, and not aspects of destruction. We're going to also try to understand that all parts of the globe are interconnected, and this conference has shown that. But even within that interconnectedness, it is true to say that not everybody is connected. And higher education has much more been for a few not for everybody. We can't talk like everybody is in higher education. For responsible citizenship, therefore, what I'm trying to propose here is that higher education needs to take critically the community engagement wherever that higher education is. In terms of community engagement, what I'm trying to propose is that to educate everybody within the community to be able to stand up for what their rights are, to understand their rights, and not to be exploited. For those that are being violated, to have space to be able to speak about the violation rather than being apologetic ap about it. In conclusion, therefore, I want to say that higher education needs to be a platform for students who can fit and who can, uh, it, sorry, to create in higher education, I'm talking about creating ethical learning environments in which students can learn the principles and traditions of professional practice and develop knowledge and skills to help them become responsible citizens and ethical leaders. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And that was, you just found the right words to close this session that has dealt with ethics, quality, and sustainability, and ethics and responsible global governance. We want to thank all of you panelists. Um, Professor Upolu Lumavai, I hope you are back because you had problems with your system. Um, Jessica Jene Peter, and of course, Professor Dr. Kanan Kitani who's been very, very gracious in even asking the fundamental question, how do we keep the bridge um, going? And find, last but not least, um, uh, Professor Dr. Esther Mombo, old time friend of ours from St. Paul's University. You have really expanded the scope of interconnectedness as something that we have to take to the next level and that no one be left behind. Um, we are almost like coming to the end of this session. We did notice that there were not many questions asked, so that I will be inviting now um, Professor Dr. Amele Ekwe, who is the 
academic dean at globeethics.net with Anya Andrea Masi from Madagascar. So please um, go to the next item we have. That's the second to the last item, which is the digital poster virtual paper award ceremony. Um, Amele, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Obiora, our director. Uh, it is probably uh, the most uh, pleasant uh, part of the program because we have the joy to look back to a wonderful engagement of all our participants in the pre-conference period. And part of it was uh, the invitation that uh, we um, launched to, to submit digital posters and virtual papers. And that is the purpose of this award uh, ceremony. And I'm very pleased to collaborate with my colleague uh, Anya uh, in, uh, this, um, uh, in this award uh, ceremony. Um, maybe we can have our slides, uh, Victoria, please. A beautiful word that comes from us from the late poet Maya Angelou says, when you learn, teach, and when you get, give. So for us, it is a time of learning and perhaps also a time of understanding our teaching in a different way. We have received a lot and so we would like to give back in this award ceremony. We would like to give it back to you, the participants. The award presentation uh, will also be shared by the globeethics.net social media on our website um, and the digital posters and virtual papers awarded will be placed on globeethics.net library to ensure that your work remains visible and also uh, publicly accessible. Let me continue. After this event, we will be sending the award recipients the award certificates by email. So please do take a photo of you and your team, if possible, holding the winner's certificate and then email them back to us because we love to share your photos and success online and in print. So now we, let me just say also that uh, we have a hashtag. So if you want, to tweet about this event, please use hashtag building new bridges together. Now at globeethics.net, we like to, to model uh, what we are talking about. And so you have seen in the pre-conference and in this conference that we have invited tandems of speakers. Uh, established, um, seasoned scholars, with emerging scholars. And we like to practice this in our organization ourselves. We understand ourselves as a learning institution. And so our collaboration, Anya's and mine, stand for this type of model of learning from one another and supporting one another. So we, we are impressed by the diverse, diversity of uh, thematic engagement in the around uh, 30 digital posters and visual papers received. And we recognize all the valuable submissions that uh, we received. So we would like to give an overview on the various themes. You see that in the two categories of digital posters and of the virtual papers, we have received many contributions from different countries addressing all the four different thematic tracks. We have case studies, uh, we have investigations uh, into pedagogical uh, issues, we have contributions that addressed uh, the visions in higher education. Uh, we have excellent contributions 
uh, about what it means to emphasize and strengthen ethics in higher education for a global citizenship and many contributions that are embedded in our current situation um, under the pandemic and uh, emerging uh, from this experience. And now it is our unique privilege to announce to you the winner with the most votes uh, of um, you, the participants, uh, in our poll. Namely, a contribution by Richard Everson Bill Sumigar, who has contributed a digital poster entitled Student Responsibilities to Government Regulation Regarding to COVID-19 Pandemic. You see the poster here, and we would like to offer the prize of one free GlobeEthics.net course from a selection that we will uh, offer, or alternatively, five volumes of the GlobeEthics.net Education Ethics Series. If Richard Everson Bill Sumigar is among us, we would like to recognize you. Please write something in, in the chat section. Uh, we congratulate you and we will reach out to you uh, for your prize. Um, and you will of course also receive uh, an award certificate uh, from globeethics.net signed by our president uh, by our uh, executive director, excuse me, um, and that will be mailed to you after this conference. And now we would like to, we wish to thank our jury composed of uh, our four, our four uh, pre-conference uh, moderators, as you can see, Maria Eugenia Barroso, Herbert Makinda, David Montealegre, and Maria Lucia Uribe. And uh, they were the ones who helped us to identify the, 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 the first runner-up the, the runner here. Yeah. So thank you, great thanks to you for this. And the first runner-up is Kadiali Zoher. He has contributed a virtual paper under the title Ethical Leadership in a globally dynamic world. He is the first runner-up selected by our jury and the prize for our first runner-up is uh, two volumes uh, of the globeethics.net education ethics series number one and two. Congratulations to you also. And the second runner-up is sorry, is Mrs. Irene, Irene Luigi with her virtual paper on uh, reimagining solidarity, the ethical duty of global citizens in times of COVID-19. Together with the signed, together, I mean, there will be the signed certificate together with the GlobalEthics.net Education Ethics Series number four publication on mainstreaming ethics in higher education. And, uh, and uh, it will be mailed to you after, the, uh, after the, the conference. So congratulations. Congratulations also from me and the entire GlobeEthics.net team. We are indeed very pleased uh, to see um, how many have contributed uh, to uh, the pre-conference by way of submitting papers and uh, posters. And we would hope that uh, we can continue to collaborate uh, around this, that we will receive the full papers for our proceedings. Um, and um, I would like to say that um, it is, um, yeah, indeed um, an expression also of um, how uh, we want to um, collaborate, cooperate with all of you in this uh, conference, having a pre-conference period, a conference day, and um, a post-conference uh, period. Our director 
uh, will speak to that um, in a moment. I will close again, taking up uh, again this beautiful quote of Maya Angelou. When you learn, teach. When you get, give. We have learned a lot. Uh, we have also reflected about how we need to change our teaching, online teaching in general, as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic. And we have received a lot, we got a lot. And so we would also like to give back. I turn now again to our executive director for the closing session. We have received abundantly. We have been enriched. What have we learned, Obiora? Thank you very much, Amele, Professor Ekue, for the beautiful certification exercise that has happened. Um, I would like to think that Angela Mayu, um, the great woman from the United States, when you learn, teach, that's the sharing. And when you get, give, that's again the sharing. This is why Globe Ethics was established, to be a platform, a network that brings people together. We had over 1,500 registrations. There has been problems in some countries that people could not key in to participate. I received a lot of mails. People saying I cannot get in, I no electricity and so on. But the fact remains that for the hundreds who participated today, it was not wasted time. Starting with the pre-conference phase into the conference actual and going forward to what's going to happen. Um, you got some people not noticeable that they received certificates. All of you who want to have a certificate of participation will have to go to the globeethics.net website. There will be an information there, www.globeethics.net. You will ask for and you will receive some certificate probably um, with some conditions, of course, that will go around the world so that you can also say, I participated in this event. I would like to say great thanks to the members of the board of foundation um, the president of the foundation was speaking earlier. He made a keynote speak at the beginning. Um, board foundation member, Walter Lindsay, and uh, another foundation member, um, Rita Astfalk, have been in the background watching and actually sponsoring this event. Board member, Professor Rudolf from Sena, was a speaker at this event and had been part of the conference preparations all through. I want to thank members of board, all who could participate. Professor D.V. Singh, all the way from South Africa in Cape Town. I want to thank all members of the management of globeethics.net and all our affiliates around the world. I think particularly of the lady who put this thing on her desk for the Partnerships and Promotions Unit, Christine Hausel from the United States of America, working in close contact with Professor Amele Ekwe and Lucy Jove Lopez, the Deputy Director of GlobeEthics.net. You have been great and you can see how together with management, you've been able to pull through an entire week of people knowing that this conference is held for Globe Ethics to maintain relationship with our friends and colleagues around the world, to keep the bond COVID or no COVID, we cannot be excluded, and to ensure that we can partner on many fields. First of all, around consortium. Global Ethics is building a consortium of persons around ethics in higher education. Many of you are professionals and teachers. Your institutions are already part of it. I'm sure many more would like to join. Again, that this is out there on the website. One will read it and know how to partner. We're going to bring out a book, a publication. This is not going to end like this. It's going to come out as a publication of globeethics.net, all the powerful speeches can now be condensed so that another generation will be reading that. This answers the question by Kenan Kitani, how do we keep the bridge? We keep the bridge through publications of this conference and we already announced another conference coming in due time. This is what Globe Ethics is all about, ensuring that training, that sharing, that networks are alive. We would want to invite not only those who have presented speeches to write a paper, any of you who would like to share a research topic, you are most welcome. 
And of course, there were four thematic tracks before. This thematic, thematic tracks will continue. Um, we have reactivated our online platform for the working groups. So we have at Globe Ethics, the four groups, the topics which you know already, the visioning, the pedagogy, the sustainability and quality assurance, and the global governance, all around ethics in higher education. We do also hope to advertise and ensure that you have seen the research and the library. We're talking about millions of books on globeethics.net library. Um, these are the books where I think many of you will be able to access them just online. Don't need even to get the physical copy. They are on your telephone. You just need to have your telephone, put in the website address, and you have the book. You can then print it out if you want. They are all for free. Over 4 million books on ethics in higher education on our online library. We are looking at our time. It is 6 o'clock, my own watch. So, and we wanted to end this thing around this period. We must say thank you to all the speakers, all the panelists, all the participants, especially those who made presentations, digital papers and posters and virtual papers. You have enriched this conversation, which does not end here now. I mean, we've listened to the great ideas you brought in. There are questions that are there. Those questions will become topics for students to engage in on our online platform. Globe Ethics, as you may know, has an online course running right now on ethics in higher education uh, for which you get certificates and they are then accredited by your universities in no distant time. Thank you very, very much. All of you from around the world who participated, who fund us, who support us, who work with us, the journey ahead is much more. Um, as Tass said towards the end of her speech, interconnectedness, yes, but not everybody is benefiting. Ethics is about the common good, is about sharing. So in so far as we can reach out to those large numbers of all our friends everywhere, we want to think that the work is not finished. Already begun yet, we have begun, but we have not finished. We take particular cognizance of those who are on very many far distant areas, Indonesia, Fiji, Canada, the US, and so on, Latin America, where the times are all different. We are united through this simple tool, the fruit of digital technology. We are united in heart, in head, in heart. And ethics is the moment where we do think that what Professor Sina said, we cannot go back to the old abnormal. We have to develop a new normal. But this new normal can only happen when ethics is at the heart, when we are together, and when we are moving forward to address the questions of society. And we are together on this. And we shall conquer because that which we have is stronger than the forces of darkness. With this, Thank you very much for being part of this event. Christine, you are sure that your event has been a great success with all of globeethics.net. We are looking forward to the next event that will happen. Watch out for it. Register to be a member of our network. God bless you all and thank you very, very much.